Two. All right, good evening, everyone. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, Dave is not here right now because he's traveling. He may join us later if he is able to. Um, Karen, if you could take roll. Yes, we have Emily, JJ O'Connor, Steve Geister, Kristen Guzio, Thomas Caldwell, Lori Connolly, Alice Alison Gagnon, Amanda Serio, Judy Steele, and Jay Fondley. We have a quorum. Thank you, Karen. And I believe first up, we have a pretty packed agenda tonight with budget proposals. So first we have the proposed police department budget and Chief John King here to join us. Hey, Lee. Hello. Thank you. Oh, right. Thanks, Good. Um, you know, basically, I usually kind of just give it pretty simple and then if you have a question, you know, I'll have to answer anything with that. So the police budget is pretty much standard level with last year uh, in terms of the same number of staff and pretty much the same equipment and everything like that. Uh, really, uh, this is almost to the penny identical to last year's budget. Uh, it's only a $13,000 difference. So, uh, you know, on an $8 million budget, $8 million. So, it's kind of the financial review. You know, the issue is the police, uh, you know, we're kind of pretty much same crime levels. The, the, the things that jump out at you would be, uh, you know, mental health is uh, astronomically off the charts. Uh, mental health calls, suicides, suicide attempts. Um, sadly, that's probably the most significant uptrend we've experienced. Uh, you know, overdoses, stuff like that are pretty steady, you know, the day-to-day -day stuff, traffic complaints, things like that, domestic violence, all, you know, those are all real steady, uh, no significant increases, decreases. That's kind of the overview of you know, what's happening in the department. The biggest issue uh, internally, not externally, but externally, I feel it's mental health. The biggest issue internally is really staffing. Um, staffing, we're hurting. It, it, it's not a financial, it's not a be for money, it's not a financial situation, it's more of a, like an HR situation. Uh, we just have a lot of turnover, a lot of people leaving. Um, you know, over time, you know, through various laws and stuff, people get more benefits, they take more time off. So when you start combining people on family medical leave, sick, injury, um, you know, vacations, you know, stuff like that, and increases in uh, increases in police training. So if you have people off of trainings, you create a shortfall of staffing. Um, combine that, we've been increasing retirements, and combine that, with, we've had a significant number of candidates we've hired and very late in the process <laughs> on the verge of going to the academies. Um, a lot of them will be uh, changing their minds in the for failed entrance requirements, meaning they were approved by us, but they failed like a physical, like a lung test or something like that. So we've been kind of constantly operating at a deficit to the risk staff. And Issues, not because positions were cut per se, um, but it's affecting operations. So that's really a basic overview. I'm going to be in a few words. So, uh, you know, I welcome questions. Thank you. Thank you. How many people are in the academy right now? Uh, we have two in, but we have. We lost two, there should be four in. So two or four are in, and we have three more openings beyond that, that we're eyeing a May Academy. Yeah, tough recruiting, I assume. Very tough. Uh, I'd say we go the farthest down we've ever gone on this. Um, it's just as less people applying, there's less people taking the exam. And like I said, we have a lot that are, as they go through the process, they just change their mind. Um, we've had people leave for you know other town jobs, but it used to be if you lost somebody with the state police or a bigger police department, we lose losing them to I'm, I'm going to you know the education field, I'm going to be a laborer somewhere, or, you know construction and stuff like that. We, we never really saw that before. Did you have anything? Um, I believe that uh, the town administrator met with all department heads looking for means space. Rollover. Yes. So, you know, I have three requests on that, um, you know, in the perfect world. You know, it's basically two more patrolmen and um, a mental health commission. You 
the two patrolmen, you know, the reasons for that are really twofold. One is just, um, you know, the staffing. It's not just how many bodies you have, it's really how many deployable bodies you have. So like I said, we're, we're operating, for example, you know, currently just in patrolling, patrolmen assigned to you know, not detective, stuff like that. We're about 30% of them missing. Um, so you then add in a couple of people who are on vacation or, you know, sit at temporarily and like that. You, you, you could come in on a ship and 50% of what you're supposed to have. So you force the people against their will, stuff like that. So there's a cost that you go to the Two patrolmen will allow us, the other thing we're doing is we're pulling people out of special assignments. So we've pulled people out of traffic. We've known doing traffic. We pull people who are doing like community service stuff, outreach services, stuff like that. Um, we pull detectives out of detectives to put them back in patrol to back to some of these vacancies. So two extra bodies would help triage that and allow us to kind of keep doing these other, you know, they're not 911 responses, but to me they're critical stuff. Like, you know, we have a mental health commission, we have a domestic violence advocate. We've got a lot of good positions that we obtained through grants that are costing the town nothing. And we've lost the officers that are supposed to be working with them. So I think that's a huge problem. The other aspect beyond those two officers in terms of the supplemental need is the Mental Health Commission. Um, we've done pretty good on grants with that. We did a grant through DMH and we got one part-time. Um, we were doing that. Then through APA, we got money for a full-time. So we, we have a full-time geo diversion program with a licensed mental health commission. Um, like I said, she's busy. I, she was, you know, I heard just myself and I don't really listen to the radio when I'm in meetings in my office, but I, I heard twice today being, being deployed to calls and houses. So that's really off the charts. Now, the problem with that grant is that grant's gonna run out in two years, um, the offer funding. So we listed a mental health commission in the goal of you know, becoming a full-time long-term commitment. Um, and I'd say it's probably the most dire need in the community right now we're facing. Is that the additional, the one that you're additional, or is that covering for, for the two years? The, the one that you'd be I'd be looking to pick it up beyond the two years, not to create a second. Okay. I have a question just following up on the um, the two patrolmen that you mentioned, because I know you, since you referenced the kind of not financial, but more on the HR side in terms of difficulty recruiting and hiring and with staffing, do you think that those would be roles that you'd be able to fill, or um, given the difficulties, would it potentially be challenging to fill them, even if they were posted? You'll get filled, but the, the challenge and what's problem would happen is, I mean, if you'll get somebody, but it's taken longer, you're screening more candidates, and you're getting delayed in those academies because somebody drops out right before, you, you lose that academy spot. You can't then go to the next person. So you now have to start from scratch on the next person. So you wait six months for that next academy. Same if somebody fails a physical. You, you wait six months, three months, you know, nine months sometimes for the next academy. You'll eventually get somebody in. The problem is how many do you lose in the meantime? Three more might retire. So you'll catch up with it. But the, our problem is we've kind of had a surge in the time until the last couple of years. Some of them aren't foreseen. And you know, we're not allowed to pre hire bodies because you know, based on somebody might retire, you know what I mean? So you kind of have to wait for the opening. It's like a farm system, so to speak. You don't have money in the budget to replace them. And we're probably, you know, I, I know the fire's issued, but I think nobody has it to the length of time the police take. You know, you're probably three months of backgrounds and stuff like that uh, medical, psychological, physical exams, then you. Have them ready you can't even commit to those academy spots until you have them with all that vetting done so you can't like pre-book i can't commit to like <clears throat> september academy today they're going to say show us the paperwork on you know steve guys to show us the paperwork on john king so you do have to remember you might now, now wait two or three months for an academy <clears throat> announcement and then say okay we're going to put them in the academy six months then the fto for two months beyond that so in a best case, and I mean, if everything went right, we're probably nine months from hiring somebody to actually see them, and most often we're probably over a year. That's super helpful context. And then the one other question I had was, I know you mentioned the significant rise in mental health calls. 
And I know, I think we've been hearing that since 2020. So I was curious if the rates, are they continuing to increase or are we, is it that you're seeing levels kind of similar to 2020 and increase, 2020? Continuing to increase, you know. <laughs> you know, at first we kind of hoped it was, you know, just COVID related, uh, you know, that's a big factor. But uh, I don't think it's that simple. Um, we've seen it continue to increase over and over since then. Can I ask, you're talking about the, uh, sorry, my name is Jay Fundling. You're talking about the process of hiring people <clears throat> and that it takes a while. And you said it takes nine months from hiring them to getting them on board. So are we paying them in that meantime? You pay them once they start the academy, the first day of the academy. So while they're being vetted, while they're waiting for an academy, you do not pay them. But once they're in the academy, they are paid at, at the bottom step of the Okay. And so if I understood what you said, and I'm not, let me see if I'm paraphrasing you correctly. If we have like one spot right now, and if someone's going through the process and they drop out, that sets us back a lot. If we have three spots and three people start and two of them drop out, then at least we get one. Is that is that the thinking that we're, is that the thinking or am I totally off base? I, you might have lost me at the end there. Just that um, if we hire, if we give you, if you have one position open right now, I forget how many you said, and we Great. give you the funding for two more, then you've got three, okay? Or you said you have three positions open right now? Yep. Okay, so then we give you two more, so you got five positions. And then is it just that much more likely that one or two or three of those five will make it through the process? I mean, because I guess I'm still going back to... Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's probably the same ratio. I can say pretty much consistently for the last four groups, I had a 50% uh, success rate, a 60% success rate, a 50% success rate, and a 50% success rate. So the goal, you know, I have three openers now. My, my goal is to get all three. You know, obviously, if we got two more, that's five. Okay. We go in with the intent to get five. We, we do line up alternate candidates. You used to not be able to do that, but we've been able to change it to say, all right, if we have five openings, let's try and send seven or eight people. So okay. if somebody fails, somebody else could jump in quicker. And it costs us a little money. Now we're paying extra medical, psychological exams. Just, you, you, you're vetting more candidates, and you're telling this person, you know, work out, get ready, plan this, but you might not get it because you're an alternate. So it's sometimes harder to get that commitment from a person as opposed to saying, you have the job as long as you succeed at everything. Okay. Um, I'm, just, I'm just wondering, and I don't know, when we're looking, the reason I'm asking is because if we're looking at the big picture of the budget and like how much are, do we have in free cash? What do we do with it? If we know, okay, we've budgeted you a certain amount for salary, and we're very happy if you hire those people and spend it. But if we also know that ah, there's a pretty good chance they're not going to spend all their salary because they're not going to hire everybody, that might help us when we're deciding. So, I, that wasn't really a question. Sorry. <laughs> Just telling you why I'm asking that. No, I get that. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Have you ever hired, um, so it sounds like all of it's coming from the academy. Do you ever get hires from other departments? Departments or other like. Moving, or is that we we do, but it's rare. They're called transfers right now. Uh, you you pretty much it's impossible to get them. Uh, I've been with the department thirty years, and we're not the only one dealing with this. Every police department is, and every department, with the exception of a couple, you know, really big, really well paid departments, is looking for transfers right now, and it's so competitive. We, we can't get them. And I've, I've never seen it. I mean, you, you see right around here, Canton's looking, Randolph's looking, Braintree's looking, Weymouth's looking. But the except Boston's looking, like, I've only seen that one other time in my career. The only department even near us that's not looking for transfers is Quincy. And Quincy Cambridge were always kind of outliers in the police and they're just good sized department, very good contracts, a lot of benefits. They tend to do good recruiting. Um, but I've never seen so many, it's like the conversation at our monthly chief's meetings is how competitive it is that no one can get bodies. And same thing, they're having trouble getting them to the academy, so they're trying to transfer people. But if you're a recruit and you were trained and you're like, you have your pick of the litter right now, what department to go to, and, you know, they're not gonna come to Milton, they're gonna go to a bigger department, probably with more opportunities or, you know, a better paid department, stuff like that. Our last group, I, I, it was before I was chief, the last couple of transfers we had, I became chief in 16, just to give you perspective. I think they came in about 2013. So it moved about 10 years since we've had any transfers.
I'll ask another question. I might be asking this to every department because I ask it to the Council on Aging. You mentioned grants. Uh, how hard it is? How hard is it for you to get grants? Do you have support applying for those grants, finding the grants that exist? Is there any support that could help you with that? Uh, you know, in a perfect world, you know, a grant writer would help. You know, none of us are expert, experts in the sense, you know, we all became police officers, not grant writers. You know what I mean? So um, we kind of handle them in, a, you know, not in one person uh, fashion, meaning we target them. So if Mark Albert does traffic, he does traffic grants. So, you know, the Governor's Highway Safety Bureau grants or things like that. Um, if we have, you know, a, a grant trying to get, you know, technology or something, We'll say, all right, well, there's an administrative lieutenant that handles that, so we'll give them that. Uh, the Mills and Emergency Management, we get grants pretty frequently through. Um, but if it's like, you know, a 911 related grant, we do it through the 911 person. So we kind of, uh, we don't specialize as one person applying for grants. When it comes to a couple of the bigger ones, um, the Civilian Domestic Violence Advocate, you know, we partnered up with Dove, um, the Domestic Violence Advocacy Group, and kind of jointly did it. When it came to the Mental Health Commission, uh, I was in chief, I was deputy at the time, but I grabbed Mark Alba, who oversees community services, and I reached out to the National Alliance of Mental Illness. We started working with them. Through them, we got connected with Social Mental Health, which is now Aspire Health, and we ended up applying for a DMH grant. So we kind of tapped into other people's expertise that maybe we didn't have, and uh, that's our usual thing, so to speak. But I, I get alerted to any kind of police-related grants through like the Mass Chiefs. So if one came out tomorrow, I'm, you know, I'm making this up for, you know, additional officers or cruisers or something like that. You know, I usually kind of pre-screen them myself and then pick the right person that would be able to help. Yeah, so this, we have training, it, it's called in service. Um, it, it, it's on the tab there, it lists in, in service and then it breaks down. So we're required to do like annual in service. Um, so basically everybody goes back to like a week of training at the police academy, which is, you know, what you'd expect, you know, from, you know, medical updates, CPRs off to legal updates, um, to everything, you know, changes in juvenile law, stuff like that. And then we do a lot of specialized training. We've invested a, a lot in this mental health stuff. We send people to like crisis intervention training, mental health first aid, you know, on, uh, you know, race issues and stuff. We send people to implicit bias. We, you know, uh, trying to reduce, you know, uh, any biases and use of force, you know, stuff like that. So most of that's through that in-service line item in there, but that in-service refers to in-service training. Anybody else? I just have one quick question related to some of the in-service because I think some of those themes are in-service trainings that you brought up previously. I was curious if, like, is it, are you seeing impact in, like, outcomes in the community um, based on some of those trainings that um, that people on staff are are having um, in terms of use of force and other other aspects of their work. I, I am, I, I think we see the impacts the most, I feel, in the optional trainings we've done, as opposed to, um, you know, I don't want to shortchange this as like a job, the state mandate. So the state comes out with a mandate. Every police officer in the state has to get this, 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 which is good, you know, it's uniform whether you're here or in Springfield, you know what I mean? Uh, and like I said, that can be defensive tactics, legal updates, you know, if there's, some of those vary, some are every year, like legal updates we have a year, medical we have a year. Uh, but sometimes, you know, things might change. Like, you know, this year they might have, you know, um, implicit bias, but the next year they might have, um, you know, dealing with juveniles or, you know, stuff like that. Some, some of those classes fluctuate. I feel our most successful trainings have been kind of ones we sought out on our own. And by that, I mean, um, like de-escalation training. I, I felt we really, we were way ahead of the curve on that. Uh, you know, I put that out and we had an officer who was very interested, Volta Pires, a detective who, um, you know, he had worked in the jails, he was familiar with it. We really weren't getting that at the state level. They do it now, but um, he was willing to go out of state. We sent him to Connecticut. He became certified as an instructor. 
um, he brought that program back here. He's, he's done a great job with it. Um, we, we did a similar thing related to like use of force and um, bias and stuff like that. Uh, I sent a detective Bruce Pavard and Mike Collins, a lieutenant detective, um, who were interested in that training out of state. They became instructors. They brought that training back for free review. Um, the crisis intervention training, they have a goal for police departments to be 20% trained in that. And that's a goal a lot of police departments have not accomplished yet. I'd say we're 80% plus, like significantly, because we started it. A lot of these things have come out post tragedies. And I feel like we started them before that. And you know, I say that in a positive way. I think we kind of got ahead of that curve that you can see these trends, even not in Milton, but anywhere, like how many people with mental illness were involved in use of force situations and stuff like that. And it's like, what can we do about it? So, you know, I really credit the people that embrace that program, who put in for it, who have attended. And like I said, the 20% we don't have is just because, you know, you always turn it over, you get new hires, and sometimes you get away from class, you lose the people who had it because they retire. So it's tough to operate at 100%. But mental health first aid, we're at 100%, you know. Um, but I feel like that de-escalation program, the crisis intervention training, kind of those programs that weren't necessarily state mandated, that's where I'm seeing the biggest impact on the streets. Like the officers do a really good job of handling these situations where I felt like, not that they were mishandling it, but like when I was a young officer and you came on the 1990s, you went to a call and it was, you know, you was assigned people like they're acting crazy and you end up in handcuffs in a cell. And that is the way that person belonged. And then, the, you know, the police and this person would be like rolling around on the ground. It, it was really needless. And then in the court system and the court system wasn't doing a great job at handling them. Now, fast forward, I feel they do an amazing job to prevent rolling around on the ground, to prevent the arrest, to de-escalate these things, then to know what their options are to get these people treatment, which obviously our mental health commission helps huge with. And they know about the programs. So I feel like that's probably the number one I see. But I think the day-to-day -day de escalation that people don't see, the new stories you don't see, is because Volta Pires does a great job teaching our officers that. So I definitely see the benefits. Um, but again, not sure change in the state program. Like you have to get legal updates. You don't want to make a false arrest. You know, you have to get these defensive tactics and protect yourself. But I feel like that's just boilerplate where you know every police department can cater to their own needs, their community, and every community is different. Can I, can I step back to your, sure. your requests again? Uh, so the mental health clinician, did I understand you correctly to say that you're not, adding a, you're not asking to add a body, you're asking to pay for the body who's already there? When that grant expires, yes, sir. And when does that expire? It's good for two years. It started in 2022, it would expire in 2024. So is I, it- Excuse me, I apologize. It started in 2023 this year, it would expire in 2025. So how is it in this year's budget if we're not going to start paying it until 2025? Well, I think the goal of that is to, if, if I understand it, I just don't know if I have that direct okay. answer. I talked to the town about this. I think the goal was if that gets adopted as a town position, I think the town could still get reimbursed. So I'm, you know, say it was to be funded. Okay. My understanding, but this may have to be crosscheck with town hall, but my understanding was, say this was funded in next year's budget, mm -hmm. the town would still get reimbursed 85 that first year, but they wouldn't get reimbursed the further years going out. Do you know what I mean? So if the town so in that position, let's just say it's there forever. Okay. The town would still get reimbursed the money for that first year, but whenever that grant expires, just the reimbursement would stop where the town would absorb it then. So right now the grant is going directly to the mental health clinician. You're saying for now, the grant would go to the town and the town would pay the mental health clinician. Well, the grant goes to the town. She's paid through through the town. So she's currently a town employee, granted. Employee. Okay. So the money currently on this grant is coming to the town of Milton, going through the town payroll and going to her. But whenever that grant expires, that the intent of that is to absorb it. Okay, this might be a question for Nick or Amy Dexter, because it sounds like it should should not look like we're paying more money if we're not paying more money. 
Yeah, I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that. That's fine. That's fine. Um, and for the other question about the two increased patrolmen, if we get those, and I know you're going to hate this question, but I know nothing about law enforcement, so I'm going to ask it. The overtime. If we get more people, will we have less overtime? Because I'm noticing in the needs-based request, we've got an increase in the salary and wages, but I don't see a decrease in the overtime. Or am I totally misunderstanding? Um, yeah, yes and no. So what, what happens is, in general, does it reduce overtime? Yes. Um, there's no increase in overtime going in this year. The reason there wouldn't be a, a, a decrease is, you know, it depends on how you interpret that. But we're, you know, the goal of these people is to put them back into these programs where we need them. So if the point of these two was to put them in patrol for backfill, that would reduce overtime. But that isn't what we're looking to do. We're looking to put these into these programs where they, we have people with the mental health condition or people assigned to the traffic unit. Those aren't positions that are currently backfilled. Those are sitting vacant. So okay. if they were filling in for a sector car, so to speak, then I agree, they reduce overtime okay. to offset the equal amount. But this would be going into kind of specialty units to kind of deal with these most common reoccurring community issues rather than backfilling. So that wouldn't really increase overtime. It more addresses a current need. Thank you very much. I am told that Nick Milano has his hand up. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Chief. Um, I just wanted to just to piggyback on what the Chief was saying about that grant funded position. Our, our goal is to have that position long term in the Department of Mental Health Clinician. And, and the point of capturing it on a supplemental request was, you know, to, to let people know that that's our plan. But also, if we were to a fund, be able to fund it out of the general fund budget, we could also reprogram that grant money into something else. So the goal is that this is a position that we want in our department long term. Um, we're happy that it's grant funding for two years, but we are, we're recognizing that um, this is something we should maintain. And if we could, if we were able to absorb it into the general fund, that we were able to reprogram that grant funding to something else in the future. Um, but that was the intention behind it. And, and thanks to the chief for providing the kind of background and, and purpose for the position, but I want to provide a little bit more detail on, on the financing piece. Um, you know, we have a position for two years. If we could absorb it to the general fund budget, that'd be great. And then those grant program dollars could go elsewhere. But for now, no matter what, we have a position um, for the two years that the chief outlined. I'm sorry, I don't want to bog us down, Nick. But so when we look at the big picture of the entire town's budget, if we put this person on the police payroll, would it stay the same? Or are you saying we'll take that grant money and spend it on something else? Or we lose we the grant money? No, we would, we would roll this position into the police department budget. The budget would go up by the amount necessary. And then the grant money could be reprogrammed elsewhere. But that's under a scenario in which we're able to fund a lot of these supplemental requests, which remains to be seen. I'm still confused as to why it would affect our budget if we start it's, you know, between now and 2025, why would it affect our budget if we put this person on the police payroll? Because our point would be to try to build into these positions that we want long term into our budget rather than saying we'll address it in two years. If we were able to build it into our general fund budget now, then the issue would be resolved and we wouldn't have to pick up this conversation in a couple of years. So that was the intention behind it and why. We're happy to have it for two years, but hey, if the money was there and we could roll it into our general fund budget, let's do it. And then that grant money could be reprogrammed for those two years elsewhere to some capital projects, some other projects that okay. might not be a recurring expense. The plan was to absorb it so we have it with certainty for the long term. Thank you. So we we still will get the grant money. We don't lose the grant money. Correct. We just spend it on Correct. this. Thank you. Sorry to, for bogging us down. It's part of federal funds. I think that might have been an important part. So this is part of the town's ARPA allotment that we put towards this initiative. Thank you. And Jay, don't apologize. <laughs> this is this is oversight. This is important. And Chief, I apologize. I want to apologize <laughs> for, for being late. That's quite I came straight from Logan. I made a cup of coffee <laughs> to get the rest of the way here. So I I I'll watch I made it. Thank you. So, are there any other questions for Chief King?
Thank you for coming tonight. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Moving right along, our next agenda item is fire. Chief Madden. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Well, sir, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, fire department budget's pretty straightforward. There's not a lot of fluff. 90% of it's salaries, and the rest is made up of utilities, training, equipment. That's pretty much where we stand. Um, not a lot of, if you cut anything, then then, then it affects operations. So, um, you know, some of the things that you could see in, we do have some minor increases, not minor, but um, one of the things you'll see is the utilities. We have increases in utilities. We are building a new firehouse um, that's supposed to come online around November. So perfect time to heat it <laughs> and everything else. So so there's a draft and the size of the building is much bigger than the, the building that we currently have. So then, you know, the cost almost double for the utilities for that building. Uh, some of the projects, you know, the fire station building committee looking to, you know, maybe try and put solar on there to try and reduce any of that stuff. But as we open, as the firehouse opens, It'll be uh, gas fed boilers to heat and then electricity to um, obviously do everything else. So that's that's pretty much where we stand. Uh, fire department right now, we're two firefighters short. We have them both hired. They are select, uh, slated to start the fire academy July 17th, much like Chief King. It's a long process to hire somebody and then an eight month wait to get into the fire academy. You can't put a, a spot in the fire academy until you actually have a name. And that has to that name. Um, so then there's about an eight month wait. So um, oh July 17th, they start the fire academy. So we'll bring them on board July 3rd. Um, start them, bring them in the firehouse for two weeks, kind of get them acclimated to some of the stuff that we do. And, and, and so they understand some of the things. And we put them through a, a little mini academy for two weeks. So you really get them prepared to um, go to the fire academy. So um, once we get those two, we'll be back up to full complement. And um, that's pretty much it. Do you have any questions? How long is the academy when they get into it? 10 weeks. 10 weeks. So we do not pay them until they start. We yeah. don't pay them until we start um, July 3rd. When they come to the firehouse for their, their two weeks of training, um, we'll stop paying them then. Thank you. I'll just piggyback on some of the questions that I heard earlier. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and currently, how many firefighters do you have in the main fire station? on a shift on a shift so minimum at the fire at the headquarters is five okay. and we could have anywhere from five to eight depending on staffing if everybody's in that day um eight is, is what we have so and how big is the building today and how big is the new building square footage um i don't know the square footage of the current firehouse but i think the new firehouse is like twenty two thousand. um it's good size and you can see it out there. It's, you know. it's giant. <laughs> <laughs> so one of, the, one of the issues that you have with that is that, you know, the modern fire apparatus, the, the old firehouses were built for, for horses. Um, so, you know, now, now even the East Milton and the Blue Hill Ave station, the, the, uh, the doors aren't big enough to fit some of the new apparatus. Just uh, yeah, so like the current fire uh, fire engine we have here at headquarters will not fit in the other two firehouses. Uh, so it's just one of those things that's just they're antiquated. They need to be replaced and, uh, to keep up with the modern times. And, uh, so now with the larger station, will you have more firefighters? No, you'll keep the same five so to staffing eight. Staffing will, will remain the same. same. Yes. What's your current thinking of the start date on the next firehouse? Um, you know, some some things. It's a it's a long process, and there are some things. There's some challenges I had, obviously, with the interest rates and, and you know working with with Mr. Milano and and you know our team. You know, trying to really keep an eye on the budget and try and figure out what's the best way to do it. Um, there's a little bit of a delay just because of 
you know, how the debt works when the schools come down and we take that extra. And they were counting on the, you know, the low interest rates like two years ago. And the, and the higher interest rates now kind of throw that off a little bit. So we're working with, with Amy Dexter and, and Mr. Milano to try and figure the best, next best step. It'll be East Milton next. That's current thinking. It's, it's the current thinking, yes. Um, we'll see. Just because you have the, the piece of property that's already been bought. So it's just an easy one. Just go and put it up and, and you're done. But there's some challenges with that too. Yeah. Thank you. I have a um, hole, a little red hole yep. box Firebox. on the telephone pole outside of my house. Sure. Why? <laughs> <laughs> What's it there for? <laughs> that is for in case of emergencies. That is one of those things that, so this town and a lot of cities and towns around the state um, still have these. They're, and they're hardwired and it's a municipal fire alarm system. And basically those were dated back to the 1800s. And it's a tapper system that's Morse code. And basically if you go and pull that, that's instantaneously rings in the firehouse and we know exactly where it is. So if you have a car accident or if you have a, a house fire or a medical or something, you pull that, we're coming in no matter what. Um, so... Um, how often has it been used in the last five years in Milton? Technically, well, uh, <laughs> as far as so for a real old, for a, you know, not a prank, but oh, somebody yeah, pulled no. it because of an emergency. No, so, so those boxes are all tied to buildings throughout the town. So every school has one. Every bi uh, big business has one. Yes, we okay. require it. Every uh, you know housing housing area, you know, what I mean? okay. all has that. So we're constantly receiving those boxes. I'm thinking of on the telephone poles. Yep. Like so that just seems. Yeah, I think there was one. Antiquated. Um, there was one a few months ago. I think there was a shed fire on Maple Street. I think it was in that area, if I remember correctly. Interesting. Yeah, they still get used. They really do. A, a lot of the times it's a car accident that will. We'll pull it. Well, someone will pull it. Yeah, because if they don't know where they are and they see the fire box, they'll pull it. Yeah. And, we know exactly where that is. Um, you know, they are, a lot of people are thinking that it, it is antiquated, but- uh, Because everybody know. has a cell phone and that's Everyone what I'm gonna use. Phone. I'm not gonna run right. outside, pull the box. <laughs> right, and, and one of the things, and, and I, I think, and I go back probably seven years, um, we got a street box, and we call those street boxes, mm -hmm. in a well-off neighborhood. And I'm like, wow, that's kind of weird time of the afternoon it's not at, not after school so it's not kids whatever and we got the street box and as we were responding so we have you know we have times that we have to make and, you know and we get notified then we have a minute to get turned out put all our gear on and then and we're supposed to be anywhere in like four minutes so you know we turned out we were riding there and, and we were three quarters of the way there and then you know milton control the police dispatcher calls and says you know we have a cell phone saying um that their the house is on fire Interesting. Yeah, and um, you know when when you think about it, that was probably a three minute delay mm -hmm. in that because that cell phone doesn't go to the Mass State Police and they, they figure out it's Milton and then Milton figures out where that is and everything else. We were well already well on our way there, and um, and the the caveat to that for me is when we arrived there, we had smoke showing and we kicked in the front door, we went in the front door, and as we went in, um, you know you could only see from your waist down. With smoke and everything else, and it was a it was a kitchen fire, and as we started to knock down the fire, I could see feet off to the right. So I went over, and there was a, a woman in there, and um, what happened was she was she lived next door. It was her dad. He was making lunch, something like that, and the teenage girl, when the the kitchen caught on fire, she ran next door to get her cell phone. On the way, she saw one of those fireboxes, pulled the firebox ran to her house, called 911 on the cell phone. And that's the difference between, the, we were already three quarters yes. of the way there. And at that three to four minutes, if she didn't pull yeah. that. So I, I really think that that firebox there actually did save that woman's life. You know, and that girl, obviously, you know. So, so those, those boxes really, um, they do have a role. And, and a lot of people think, you would think they're antiquated. And one of the things that we learn, you know, if, if you lose if you lose cell phone if, you, if your power is dead or you oh, know it's jammed, um, yeah. you know during hurricanes and everything else they're still going to work those boxes have worked for 150 years now and they're still going to work they're still working yeah we um so the dpw has a, a couple of uh, workers that maintain that 
and uh, they're called the wire department and they, they test it every day and they're constantly working with it um and it's i think it's an asset to the town yeah, I'm going to walk around and look for them. <laughs> I am. <laughs> we told my kids, on, especially when they were little, we told them run and pull that. It's right across the street from us. Yeah, yeah it's one of those yeah. things, no matter what happens, no matter what, if it's something bad, you need help, you pull it. And if, if it's, you know, you're still getting two onions, a ladder and a deputy chief on the response. <laughs> so because uh, we think it's a fire, but you know what I mean? If you need the help, it's there. Yeah, it, absolutely. You know, interesting. Um, yeah, they, they are, and, and some of the things you are seeing some upgrades in that where they become radio boxes, and and uh, you know with the new firehouse we are upgrading our equipment so they're not just reading the hundred. So right now they're wired and it's hundred milliamp. So um, so we're upgrading our system so it can read radio boxes. So if a company or a building wants to put one on it's a radio box, then we'll be able to do that. So. Okay. Thank you. Always wondered about that. <laughs> <laughs> I've never noticed them. Now I'll, I'll be looking for them too. So if I understand right, this is just more my curiosity now. If someone has their cell phone out and there's one of those pull box, like the box in front of them, oh, box. what you're saying is pull the, the box. I'm thinking of like when you're on a plane and they're like, put your own oxygen mask on before the person next to you. So it would be faster to do that and then make the call. It's instantaneous. We don't even have to make the call. Yeah. Because it tells you where to go. Yeah, it's it's instantaneous and, and so, you know, and it's kinda, you know, one of the things that we show on the fires the firehouses, we have this tape, it's tapper tape, and it'll punch out a box. So each one of those boxes has a number assigned to it. Right. And then you just look up the number and it'll tell you the exact location. So um, yeah, so we look at it's Morse code, it just taps it out. It still runs. That's um, so cool. It's, it's a it's a tremendous piece of history that we need to make sure that we take with us. Yeah. Not relying on it, I mean, we still will rely on it. You know the, the the tapper part of it, but it's it's still a piece of history that you know um, we'll take with us. So I'm going to ask a very basic question. So aside from fires, what kind of calls does your department go on, and what kind of tell, talk to me about the services you provide to the town? Sure. Um, you know, I, I have to thank the Council on Aging today because I got to go have coffee with the Council on Aging today and, and they put me through the ringer today. Uh, you know, uh, I'll thank them. So again, same list, some of the similar questions. Uh, the fire department is fire rescue. I mean, we do anything. If, if, if you're having a bad day and you don't know who to call and, and you think, oh, let me call 911 and it goes into the police station. But, you know, if it's not a police matter, they, they, they turf it off to us which is fine. We love it. You know what I mean? We, we love to do anything. I mean, from fires to medicals, hazardous materials to uh, power issues, water leaks, uh, you name it, we do it. If, if someone is at home and they don't know how to handle an emergency at home or something that's going on at home, we'll respond. And, and you know, um, we're not master electricians, but we know that, you know, hey, if I kill the power to this or kill the circuit breaker, we can we'll save this or you know, where to shut off the water to, you know, or if we can't shut off the water in the house, well, we'll call the DPW and have them shut it off the street. Um, you know, gas calls. If you have a funny smell in the house, we'll come and take a look at it. If you're medically not feeling well, give us a call. We'll, we'll come in and get, make sure you get to the, to the, to the hospital. Um, we do, you know, public assists. We do anything, anything that, that if it's your worst day and you're having a tough time dealing with it and you call 911 and you need someone to come out, we'll come out. You know what I mean? And, and just try and, you know, one of the things I always say the fire department, the fire department does is advocates for the resident, the homeowner, the visitor, whoever is there, right? So if you're having an issue, then we're gonna help you out there. What if we can? What if, try and make your day a little bit better. Because if you're having a bad day, we're there to make your day better. Uh, I'd love to tell you, you know what I mean? <laughs> Car accidents, uh, hurt animals. Uh, I mean, we work with the animal control officer where we've had, you know, birds in the, in the chimney or animals in the chimney we've, we've had, yeah, I mean. So what's the line between like you and an ambulance? Like you talked about medical calls, you talked about car accidents, like what do you do? And what does the ambulance do? Sure. Dumb so, question, sorry. But. No, no, absolutely. So the, the different, out of the 57 firefighters we have, uh, 50 are EMTs and we operate at a first okay. responder level. Uh, but we outsource the the private ambulance, the, the ambulance, the EMS, uh, to a, a new company, um, and they're great. And but one of the things that we do is we arrive first. Yeah, aren't always... you the first? Aren't you like in charge when police, fire, and the ambulance shows up? 
Isn't the fire department in charge? You're getting in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was like the case, which is why so, you have to go. Because if I just need an ambulance to take a woman, my neighbor, to the hospital because she fell, right. everybody comes. Even if I right. say, I don't need everybody. Right. I just need an ambulance. You all show up. Yeah. So that's that's a, it's a great question. And, and, you know, you look at it and when someone says that they fell, you know what I mean? And said, just send an ambulance. Well, we could just send an ambulance in that sense, two people there to render aid. And, you know, who knows why that person fell, what yeah. the true story is behind that. So, uh, again, we have 50 out of 57 firefighters are EMTs. So we're all trained. We have the equipment. So we can go and we'll start rendering aid immediately. And, and um, yeah, we, you know, if it's CPR or if it's a fall or w whatever it is, you know what I mean? Like, we'll do it as, as I, at a car accident, we do the extrication. We, we get the people out of the car. Um, so the, the difference between them and us is they have, they're paramedics. So, and which is a higher level of care. Um, so it's pre-hospital care and they, um, they do a fantastic job, but we get there. And, you know, if you ever had to carry somebody out of a house, it, it can be very, very daunting and difficult. Uh, so we're just a force multiplier. We get there first, we start the interventions, do whatever we can to make that person comfortable, start life saving, whatever, whatever we need to do, we do it. And then they come in behind us. And, and, and anytime you go anywhere, it's always great to have PD with you. You know what I mean? It's an extra set of hands, it's a force multiplier. Also, you never know what's, what the, the true situation is. So it's good to have them there. Um, with you, um, so the, ultimately the, the, the ambulance company will, will then transport to that patient to the hospital, and that's where we kind of separate. But you know, I'd, I'd have to say probably at least once a week if it's a serious medical, serious car accident, and they need a lot of medical attention, our firefighters jump right back in, in the in the back of the ambulance with them and take that ride to the hospital with them and, and, and render aid the whole way there, just if they need an extra set of hands. So, um, thank you. Anyone else? Did we ask about the needs-based requests? If not, I'm asking it. about the needs-based requests. I, I, I did it since I got my, the memo that we might not be getting there. <laughs> From, no, just when Nick responded to the last that we might, uh, we have to balance the budget before we get to needs. <laughs> Put Nick on mute. Yeah. <laughs> well then. <laughs> So, sure. I, I mean, we do have a couple. We, uh, this is obviously needs some of the needs that we have, uh, and, you know. I, and I did, you know, send a couple along. Uh, one of the things that we've had, we've had an open um, lieutenant position for a few years now, and one of the things that I requested was to take that position and bump it up to an assistant chief. Um, with the with the new firehouse, we've had an opportunity to really sit back and, and read take a good look at the fire department, the fire department operations and, and where we are. We're, we're, we're antiquated in, a, in, a, in some of the things that we do and how we manage things just because of the old firehouses. Now moving into the new firehouses, we're moving into new software. We're currently training actually this week on the new, new firehouse software and dispatching software with PD. Uh, so we need someone to manage that. You know, uh, we just picked up a new software to scheduling and help with, with uh, you know, scheduling and, 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 and uh, trying to fill, you know, vacations and all that stuff and manage all that stuff. So we just picked that up. So we need someone to manage that. Um, you know, one of the questions we looked, we, we talked about earlier was, was grants. I, I know that you, you guys asked grants and, and managing a grant is, is, is not an easy thing. So when you look at it, you know, we, we were able to um, secure some money for new portable radios through the opera funds. And that grant to manage it has been very, very difficult because it's almost a year and a half out now from when we asked for everything, we still don't have that equipment yet. So tracking all that equipment, tracking the pay, you know, all that stuff. Um, the, uh, the administrative assistant, uh, Kim has done a fantastic job. She's new to the job. She's done a fantastic job. And Patty before have done a fantastic job taking, you know, really keeping track of that stuff, but just to manage that, you know what I mean? Like anytime you, you have a grant, you have to write it. And, and there's an equipment grant that we usually get every year. Um, it's not a lot of money. It's, well, it is, you know, you're talking $14,000 last year. Um, so, you know, that, that's some good equipment there that we can do, but just to manage that and follow up. And then and at the end of the grant, when you get everything there, you have to then write up like how you use it and everything else. So grants could be tough right now. We're, we're, um, partnering with Norfolk County to, 
Um, I think there's 25 towns, 25 fire departments that are looking for a new incident command system in, in the, you know, that they just recently put in for that. So working with, with the other fire chiefs on that to try and put us all on the same page, it's time consuming. So when you look at managing, you know, the fire department and fire, you know, how we do things, you know, so that assistant chief position would be valuable to, to us and, you know, moving forward, you know, um, and then, you know, you, you talk about the, the maintenance and the care of the new firehouses, the old firehouses, maintenance and care of the, the, of the fire apparatus and the equipment that we have. Uh, it's, it's there's, a, there's a lot and we can do a lot better with it. And it just, you know, the infrastructure has kept us back for so many years. And now moving into the new firehouse, it's a, it gives us an opportunity to really look and see how we're doing things and, you know, move forward and, you know, again, software. Um, everything's computerized and, and really try and manage that through, through that, those, ma those means. And just to have the person there to, to be able to do that. Um, so it's, it's really a, a great spot for us, you, you know. Um, so um, I don't know if you received any of this. I don't know if you guys got this. Uh, so one of the things that we're also looking at is one of the things is looking at 20 firefighters. You, you know, um, we have one person on the ladder truck right now. And then with all these 40B projects that are coming in and, and you know, some of these taller buildings and stuff. Um, yeah, that to, to supplement the, the current staffing, um, four new firefighters, that would be one person for each group. And that would put a second person on the ladder truck. Um, that, that's, an, that's another need that we'll see that, you know, if we keep on going with, with these bigger buildings and it's something that we may need. Can I ask a question to that? So I know when it comes to like the school budget, you can't really look, for, you can't project um, student, like the number of students that are going to be there. But we do know, I don't know how many new units have been since 300 or something. There's a huge number. And then looking, so knowing that that will take a little bit of time to build, Notice which is I like, but a little time to build. And then your timeline for getting training staff in. Um, what did you say the typical, like what's the timeline from eight months? It's it's probably close to 10 months by the time we, we call for a list and then everyone comes in and signs. And, get the list. and then uh, typically about a seven, eight month wait for the fire academy. Because yeah, I, I think that's where, I mean, I just... I, you know, I get nervous is that, especially if you have the same concerns that the police does as far as like filling the positions, because there's a, that's a, it's a huge, there are a lot of buildings going in and a lot of things. So making sure that we're set for that seems. Yeah, it's, it's something that, you know, when you really have the opportunity to sit back and take, take a look at the fire department and how we operate, mm -hmm. you know, but going into, and again, when you have this, this, this change, right, you have an opportunity to sit back and really take a look and see where we're, oh, we've been doing it this way. Well, we've been doing it this way for a hundred years because of the building that we're in. Now we have the opportunity to really take a look at it. And then, and that's what I do, you know, I've been doing the last couple of years and, you know, just trying to prepare us for the future. And, you know, it's not just for, for right now, but it's for 10 years for, you know, down the road. So that's where it's, where it's important um, for me in that. Can I ask a question too? So with the new, with the new building, when you, with the budget, and this might be a silly question, I don't know how else to ask it, but there's the, the building construction, like whatever the, but how much of the, you know, the, the equipment and the infrastructure, you know, the infrastructure follows versus how much has to be new that, and is there new, you know, cause you're dealing with an old fire department, firehouse and how much of that new, um, or the infrastructure, whatever is going into it, is accounted for in that budget versus stuff that you would need. Does that make any sense? No, no, it totally, totally does. So anything that's on the apparatus is is going to go with us. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, you know, some of the things that we have, you know, some computers and, and whatever, some of that will go with us as well. Stuff that's newer will, will go with us. But like, you know, when we talk about the fire alarm boxes, our computer that reads those fire alarm boxes is is old. So we're getting a new system. We're upgrading it so we can it can read the the hundred milli app. Uh, amp boxes and radio boxes. So we are, um, one of the things that we're looking for, and it's a bigger piece of, of item, a bigger cost item is the um, the compressor that fills our air tanks. You, you know what I mean? That, that Our compressor currently right now is about 25 years old. Uh, so we are in the new firehouse, we're operating it and going to a, a, new, a new system. And that, you know, it's something that needs to be done. It just needs to be replaced and, and, and go forward. So, and that is all accounted for in the budget for the new firehouse.
Can we go back to the, was it assistant fire chief? Yes. So you said you were going to upgrade a lieutenant, if ideally. Your yeah, plan. so in our budget, I think we were, um, and it was never funded, but we were okayed a, a fire lieutenant position. That we Correct. Can see was empty, and I think it was back in 2016. It's never been funded. So I asked for that last year, and, you know, um, we were unable to get that position. But in, in the meantime, since I really looked at that position and where it would fit in the hierarchy of the, of the fire department, um, we do have – so. We do have a fire prevention officer, and that's where I was thinking where, you know, with these new buildings, that, it would, that person would then assist the fire prevention officer. But then, you know, when you look at the, at the overall picture of that, you know, um, I think an assistant chief to take on some of the administrative duties, like looking at, you know, maintaining these new fire houses, maintaining the apparatus, maintain, you know what I mean? We can kind of make it, and a lot of departments around us have this thing that's called chief of operations, and just managing the day-to-day -day operations. And then that would allow me to work with the fire prevention too, because ultimately is there's a, you know, the fire prevention lieutenant lets me know that authority having jurisdiction is me. So no matter what he signs off on, he's signing on my name. So then if you had that lieutenant, they would still be doing the same thing. I would still have to follow up on everything. So, you know what I mean? So that's where, if you have that assistant chief for that person to handle some of the day-to-day the, the -day operations and and then, then uh, allow me to work up with fire prevention on uh, a lot of things that we have. And then, you know, really still having, you know, to move forward and kind of move the forward uh, into the 21st century. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure I have it right. So with at the lieutenant level, is it that there's been the request to have that role and it hasn't been able to be posted or is it that you posted it and it hasn't been filled yet i just want to make sure i so i think it was approved by the personnel board back in 2016 but never funded it was never put into our budget okay so, so it could never right so when i was looking at the budget one of my first year as chief and again taking a, a good look at something from a distance was like why don't we have that position and it was like well it was just never funded so that's why i asked for it last year uh, to try and get that position and some of the things that we're looking at uh, you know, and that position was going to be a part-time training officer and a part-time fire prevention officer. And, and uh, you know, I think that assistant chief would fill those roles. It will allow me to fill some of the roles and, and he could, or that other person should be able to take that, that position. Um, so that, that's where we're at. And that's why I kind of upgraded a little bit. And, you know, it, it carries a little more weight. And Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. That makes sense. I just wanted to make sure I understood that because I was thinking, you know, along the lines of staffing and what Chief King had also shared ar around the difficulties of recruiting. And I think we see that in a lot of municipal roles. Um, I was curious what it's like for the fire department. Like, is it hard to fill open positions? Is it not hard it's somewhere in the middle or? <laughs> so, you know, uh, it's it's not hard. You know what I mean? I feel very blessed. Um, since I've been chief, I've hired seven and phenomenal, phenomenal people. And so it's been really easy for me, uh, to fill those roles. But one of the challenges that you see is that, you know, when I took the test and, and wanted to get on here, there was probably 50, 60 people waiting in line to take the job. The last time I, I hired, I called for a list from civil service and they sent me a list of 18 names. And, you know, those are all, they're all residents in the town. So then, you know, you, you put it out to 18 people and only 10 came in and signed the list. Mm -hmm. And then when you say, okay, everyone come in and, and grab a, an application, you know, it's due next Friday. Well, only five actually turn the, the application in. So the numbers, are, you know what I mean? You're just less to choose from. Mm -hmm. But again, you know what I mean? One of the things that, you know, I love about the fire service, it's a very, very difficult job to get. And if you're trying to become a firefighter, it's a two to three year process. You know, you have to think about taking that test. You have to sign up six months before that civil service exam, sign up for it, do well on that exam, and then wait and hope that there is an open position. And then when you finally get that opportunity, you have to do well and really stick with it. And then, you know, it, it was great to sit there and tell these two new guys that, hey, congratulations, you're going to be a mobile firefighter. They're like, great, when do I start? Eight months. It, you know what I mean? So it's kind of, you know, it's a little bit of a difficult and and you know i'm hoping that neither one of them take a better job in in the meantime you know they have to still continue with what they're doing they still have families and and, and everything so you know I, I really hope that in the next you know four months that they don't take a job elsewhere and you know hopefully that they they are dedicated to us again because like chief king said if one of them falls out then now we have to go back and start from the beginning all you know so it, it has its challenges does that happen often 
that someone will kind of start and then because of the timing, they end up taking something else or is it pretty infrequent? I think that's why we have, so you take the test, you know, um, so you sign up in April, take the test in October. And then by the time the list comes out, the list is coming out, the new list is coming out April 15th. Um, if they haven't been, you know what I mean? And then they spend six months on that list. If, if they haven't been called by the fire department in that six months and they have an opportunity, I think they have to take care of themselves and their families and, and take whatever they have. So sometimes, and I think that's why you don't have all 18 coming in to sign that list. You know what I mean? I know, I know um, one, you know, I called him and said, hey, you know, do you want to come in for the interview? And he was like, sorry, I'm joining the military tomorrow. And I said, ah, <laughs> you know, can you go back and take that away? But, uh, you know, he was joining the Coast Guard, so I'm a Coast Guard guy. So uh, God bless him and, you know, happy for him. But, uh, yeah, it's just one of those things. Yeah, so it does happen every once in a while. Thank you. And just, sorry, I have all these questions. One other thing you mentioned about the list of yep. residents. So do um, to be a firefighter in Milton, do you have to be a Milton resident? Through civil service, there are certain tiers that go and um, and residency is, is the big one. So, you know, to get through all of our residents is, you know, 18 people, you know, um, even still hiring seven off of this list we still have uh, several people that are still on that list wait, waiting that would take the job if we if they could have it. So residence is, residency is, is huge uh, for the civil service uh, portion of it. You have to live in there at least a year before that exam. So. Thank you. I have a question. So is your overtime pretty standard? Is that a pretty standard number year to year? Is this high? Mm -hmm. That number to me, I, I think, is low that's in there. Yeah, so one of the things that you look at, you know, and we've been pretty stagnant on that number is, you know, um, every time the firefighters get a raise, if we get a 2% raise and we don't increase our overtime budget, then it's almost like a 2% decrease in that. You know what I mean? So you, you can only afford some of that. And, and, and overtime is a challenging thing. You know, there's so many different things that we hire over, overtime for. Um, you know, if somebody gets injured uh, and then all the contractual time off, you know, with vacations and sick leave and, and you know, you had some holidays and whatever, you know what I mean? So it's all there. And so it, it all depends on how it's going. And then, uh, you know, some of the things that we also spend overtime on is training. You know what I mean? We train in-house. Uh, everything is in-house. Um, but every once in a while, you need to send somebody out to do some training, to, to bring it back. Uh, you know, some of the things that, you know, currently right now, we have a few members training on that new software and they will train the whole department um, coming up in the next month or so. Um, some of the things that we're looking at, you know, um, Nero's law. Nero's law was mandated by the state that all firefighters, uh, I, I believe PD, I'm not really sure on them, but have to be trained in uh, taking care of uh, dogs canine dogs. Um, it's one of those things that they said, you know, you need to be able to, to, to assist us. And, and that's a challenge, right? That they said it was a date had to be done by February 28th. And most fire departments weren't able to do that, you know, because you need the vets to teach you how to do it. You need the dog mannequins to, 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 to be able to do it. So that's a challenge that, that we have. That'll be coming up. We'll, we'll have to train all our firefighters on doing that. Um, then you look at Asher, which is the active shooter hostile event, you know, that's one of the things that we're starting to train on. We're working with, uh, with PD on, on, on doing that. So training is, you know, sending people out to take those classes and then come back and teach our members how to do it. Um, and then there's a couple other things, you know, there's some state teams that we support that support us. Um, you know, the state hazmat team, technical rescue team, uh, our fire investigators. Our fire investigators take a lot of classes and they need to be up to, up to speed on, on some of that stuff. Uh, it, you know, and they're required every fire that we have in the state has to be investigated and reported to the marshal within 48 hours. So um, after every fire, we have a fire investigator respond and you know, it's coming from off duty. You, you know what I mean? So that, that's an overtime. Um, one of the things that we also do is when we have a fire, we bring in mutual aid, which is of the surrounding towns. Uh, we also supply mutual aid to, to them. Like they went to Canton last night on a second alarm fire. Well, when the, the engine goes out, we need to then back staff, backfill the department to make sure that the, we still have adequate staffing in the town to do that. So over time, can be, it, can, it can really jumble. And you look at like, you know, something like the last few years, right? 
with COVID and flu and everything else. And one of the things you look at is, you know, say, hey, if you're sick, stay home. Right. You know what I mean? And, and, and you know, so you're seeing not that you're seeing a huge uptick in tick in sick calls, but we still have members getting COVID. You know, I get every once in a while, I'll get a call. Hey, I got COVID, you know. Uh, so then you have to quarantine and do all that stuff. So then that kind of that'll kind of jump up the overtime a little bit, too, when you get, you know, especially where you have three members in a firehouse. If, if you go to the same call and that person, oh, by the way. <laughs> They've been coughing and everything else. I have COVID, and it's like, oh, well, thanks. Everybody just got COVID. <laughs> Everybody just got COVID. Yeah, so that's one of the things that you know. Um, so you're seeing a little bit of you know. So um, yeah, so it over time varies year to year. Anything else? Chief, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. Your service. <laughs> Enjoy your night. I think you had a long night, right? <laughs> Enjoyable nonetheless. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks. Next on the agenda is library. Can I say this the right way? It's is it Miss is it William Ad Adamzik? It's good enough for me. How do you say it? Adam Zick. Adam Zick. That's how my dad says it, so that's how I say it. All right, Adam Zick. Mr. This Adam is Paul Zick. Hayes, uh, the chair of the trustees. Mr. Hayes, welcome. Good evening. Um, you know, I just want, I was thinking three things while uh, Chief Madden was talking. Uh, one, I don't know what's an older technology, those fireboxes or the Dewey Decimal System. Um, <laughs> right. Do a library joke. Two, right, right. Um, you know, we, we've had. Um, the fire department call to the, the library, uh, both for you know medical purposes, but also for the weird smells that he was talking about, right, uh, with the HVAC system. So we've actually used um, every department that's here tonight, uh, from police to consolidated to DPW, and the library wouldn't be able to function without all of those departments pitching in and helping out the library. And then the third thing um, is just a, uh, I was fortunate enough to join Milton in a very new library building. I was also fortunate enough to be two, three, five years into a new building when the maintenance contracts that were built into the building costs came up and I had no idea. Um, so that's something that I'm sure Chief Madden is already aware of, but that caught me a little bit off. So um, I'd also like to say, thank uh, Hyacinth Critchlow, one of our trustees who's here, and Sarah Trogue, who's uh, the assistant director at the library. Join, uh, join us tonight. I have a quick presentation, if that's okay. Um, if I can do screen sharing, I'll, I'll just show it right up on the, the board. I don't know who's in charge of, Fifth copy is of that. Now is here. There we go. Perfect. Um, bear with me. I'll try to be, try to be as brief as possible. Good, great, thank you. Um, so again, thanks for uh, giving us the time to talk to you tonight. Um, I wanted to talk uh, just a moment to give you some perspective about uh, library services and how the library has been uh, performing over the last couple of years. Um, and one of the things that we look at um, as far as usage is our circulation. Um, and as you can see from this slide, uh, our circulation has been increasing year over year. Um, and you can kind of see in the middle there, that was COVID where print went down and digital went up. That's actually coming back where more people are checking out real physical books again. And you can see that in this slide where 55% of all our usage right now is print books. So the book isn't dead, people are checking out books. They're still using digital, and then there's still people hanging on to other uh, formats as well. Um, and just digital is a big thing for us now, right? It's a third of our usage. Um, majority of that usage is ebooks, about a third, and about a quarter of that is audiobooks. Audiobooks were really big during COVID. They haven't gone away. Uh, I think people use podcasts as a gateway to audiobooks, and audiobooks, especially digitally, have been very strong ever since. So putting it, that was, that was looking, comparing ourselves to the past, um, looking at Milton um, within 
the state. Um, prior to COVID, the library was ranked 45th, which is respectable out of you know, the hundreds of cities and towns uh, that are in Massachusetts. Over the last couple of years, because of how the library was able to respond um, to COVID, um, to only be closed for you know, about six weeks before we started offering different kinds of remote services, um, we responded well, our community responded well to us um, and we've gone up in the ranks um, of libraries throughout the entire Commonwealth up to 29th, which is, we're very proud of and it's, and it's a, a pretty big leap for us. This is just a snapshot of some of the libraries that are around us in, in, that, in that chart. Um, and it you know, kind of shows us our neighbors. One of them is literally basically our neighbor in, in Weymouth. And you can see the comparative populations, our total CERC activity means how many things are checked out uh, served by a full-time employee and so on. Now, what we see from looking at that uh, compared to these top libraries in the state is that we're less staffed and we're, and we're having more checkouts. So we're, more, we're using less people to provide more services. And we had a, a much lower municipal appropriation than most of those communities. I'll just go back and I, I can share this with everybody as well. Um, and then, of course, the top ranking libraries are the large cities, right? So we can't uh, quite compare ourselves to those. However, we look at population cohorts too. So the libraries that are closest to Milton in our population cohort, we looked at the top 25 libraries and we compared ourselves again in, in similar categories. And the thing that once again stood out was that in that 25, we ranked fourth overall for um, circulation per employee. Um, but we ranked 15th in overall appropriation. So again, we're trying to do more with less people. Um, usages of just checking out books or helping people download or answering reference questions, it's also programming. And this is you know, a really big part of what the library does. Um, and as, as Sarah Troke, who also runs the children's department can tell you, the last two months alone, uh, the children's department had over a thousand people per month at programs uh, in the children's room. Uh, but looking back at the last fiscal year, you know, we offered 600 programs throughout the year, 500 uh, programs for children and teens, over 12,000 people attended those programs. Um, you know, that's 20% more programs, 44% more attendees. Part of that is um, the environment where we're slowly moving away from uh, 2020 and 2021. Um, but it's important that this is, this shows that the library is a community meeting place. It's not just books and studying. It's also where people go to meet, people go to enjoy concerts. We had 90 people at an Irish concert on Saturday. Um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of highlights and some things that we've done over the past year that aren't just these metrics. Um, and, you know, that includes working on a strategic plan. Uh, the trustees and I worked on a strategic plan that was adopted um, and we are beginning that plan this year. Uh, we started something called Milton Moves, which is a, an initiative that was year long, uh, involved uh, creating a story walk, portable dance floor, it was a, a getting, getting moving, getting outdoors type of program. It was successful enough um, that we are kicking, we kicked off a second year of a program called Milton Grows which will include container gardens and programs about gardening and uh, sustainability. Uh, the trustees created an equity and inclusion subcommittee that worked with the town's um, all the equity committee as well, um, and has been involved in, in the, I should say, the, the town board, but as well as the, the municipal uh, town hall committees. We started having, we had our first writer in residence program, and we partnered with other uh, organizations in the community, including Forbes House, the Milton Coalition. Um, and then, as far as um, you know, physical plant of the library, we upgraded a 10 plus year old automated materials handler. This is the sorter that automatically checks in our books for us. We created shade structures outside so we could expand more programming out, so outdoors, especially in a post COVID world. We instituted wireless printing. Uh, in, in, in addition to that, it's the first time we're all able to accept um, online and digital payments, um, phone payments for printing. And with consolidated facilities, uh, we had new and more efficient lighting installed. This slide has a lot of words, um, 
but basically what it says um, is that we, we couldn't do this without the library staff. We couldn't do it without planning. Our uh, strategic plan is important to us. The trustees and I look at it regularly. Um, it helps guide us. Um, we couldn't do it without adapting to the different needs of the town, trying to change with the needs of the town. Uh, we couldn't do it without support from the friends and the foundation. And I'll mention them again in a, in a moment. And like I started off with, we couldn't do it without other uh, town departments to help us get where we are today. Um, the library submitted um, a budget request, uh, a needs-based budget request. So our needs um, are people right now. Um, one of our needs base is a, a 1.5 FTE addition to the library. And I try to put it into perspective. Um, you know, one of the, the things that, that people talk about is that the, the people move to Milton to the schools. And, and that's true, and the school population has increased. And to some extent, the school um, staffing has increased to meet those needs. And over that same time period, um, the library staffing hasn't increased. But um, we receive those families in the library um, from birth till they go to school. Uh, they're at our story times and all our programs. Um, once they get through the school a little bit and they're in Pierce, um, they're coming to the library after school to hang out in the teen room or to uh, do Dungeons and Dragons or to do uh, other, other uh, teen events. So we're dealing with that growing school population, but we haven't had any additional staffing to help with that. So this 1.5 FTE is a combination of um, staffing that would help allow us to do more programming. Uh, we did a recent uh, community survey, uh, an outside group did it for us and one of the biggest um, concerns was that our story time and children's programs fill up too fast. People have to register and we just run out of space. We don't have enough time or people to offer more. Um, the other thing is an outreach librarian and that survey showed that people want more library access at different points in the community. Um, so that includes farmer's market, it includes going to the schools, um, includes just being out in, um, in the community, things like uh, Celebrate Milton. So one of these positions is a, is a full-time position that would be a reference outreach librarian. Uh, part of the outreach is also uh, PR, social media, half, not half of what we do, but part of what we do is trying to advertise what our services are to people, but we don't have a staff member who does that. Um, so that would be part of this shared role. And the other part-time position would really just be support for more programs. Um, our other need is, uh, is increased electricity costs. Uh, despite reducing overall kilowatt usage at the library, uh, mostly through uh, initiatives through, of Bill Ritchie and Consolidated, um, our costs have continued to rise and, and they're significantly higher this year than last year. Um, and the final cost is uh, an increase to our books and materials line. Um, part of that is because there's a state required minimum mandate um, and we are only meeting the minimum mandate. Uh, with this budget, we would need that 9,000 more to meet that minimum mandate. I should also mention, um, and I've, I've said this in, in the past, that the library has good deals. We can buy hardcover books for $20 or less, but the same eBooks that you might buy for $9.99, we're buying for $40 or $50, um, and they're licensed to libraries, so after you, they're used 12 times, we have to buy them again. So. That's, that's part of our increased book cost. Um, so our request is about $120,000 over fiscal 22. Uh, it's only 45,000 over what we requested last year, but, but it's 120 over appropriated. So we've been asking for these positions for a number of years. Um, this budget would meet all the state minimum requirements, um, including the book budget. Um, the priorities I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, I should mention that the uh, union has settled its contract, so that will be um, included at some point in this budget process. Um, the rest are mostly contractual increases for IT and building maintenance. I just want to mention again that you know we don't rely solely on um, town appropriations. Uh, the friends of the library pay for all library programs, so. All the crafts for the story times, uh, concert that we had this weekend, speakers, um, whatever we need for programming is funded by the Friends of the Library. 
Uh, Milton Library Foundation funds a number of different things, but especially over the past several years, they've really been helping with our ebook and digital collections. Again, those costs are twice as much, demand is up, and, and the book budget's about the same as it was. Uh, and the trustees do a lot more on the building itself. So they helped with the new sorter and the new wireless printing solutions that were then built into the budget um, last year. And they funded the shade structure of the writer in residence. Um, and I should say that I'm very active in the Mass Library Association, uh, where uh, we work on advocating at the statewide level for increased state aid to public libraries. And we also have uh, an ebook bill that's been uh, presented by Representative Balder of Newton. Um, and uh, I helped draft that legislation. We're hoping to that will help drive costs down eventually. I should mention about state aid um, that you know, I, I like to think it's our advocacy at work. Um, state aid to Milton has gone from uh, thirty dollars to $35,000, close to $60,000 in the last five years. So part of that is increased funding, but part of it's our increased usage as compared to other libraries as well. So I think I, I touched on a lot, not just the budget, but I, I, I thank you for uh, indulging me with this time to just kind of give you a picture of uh, what we do, um, highlight some of our usage, some of our metrics, and some of the bigger picture things as well. So thank you. So last year you presented to the work committee and said that you were working to try to reduce the cost of the electronic books. Yes. And so you, you're going through legislation to do that, basically. Yeah. So um, we we introduced a bill last year uh, in, the, in the state house, and last year we introduced a bill based on copyright law. Um, and we're working with other states as well, and we're working nationally. And that bill was introduced prior to us in Maryland and in New York. Uh, it was challenged by the big six publishers in Maryland and didn't pass. In New York, it passed, uh, but was vetoed by the governor. Um, so we've been working with a couple of uh, think tanks and library uh, political action groups that um, we've rewritten the bill this year to be a consumer protection bill. Um, and we've worked again with legislators um, and, and you know, a couple of different legal think, uh, think tanks that law schools. Uh, Massachusetts has one of the strongest uh, consumer protection laws in the country. Uh, so we've introduced this consumer protection this time. Um, we are working on getting a, more sponsors to sign on. Uh, there's another bill introduced in the Senate, so it's going to be in the House and the Senate. Um, and we're very optimistic. Uh, there are other states that are going to be introducing the legislation uh, as well. And um, the American Library Association is looking at it to try to kind of be a boilerplate going forward. Um, there'll be challenges along the way, but as more and more states get involved, um, prices have started to creep down kind of like silently. Um, we think as a result, uh, they're feeling the, the pressure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. I think Judy had mentioned having a question, so I don't know if her hand is raised. But... Her hand is not. Judy, if you're able to unmute, you can ask your question. Oh, she's texted me, let me see. <laughs> Judy, do you have a question? There's her hand. <laughs> it's like we're having a seance. <laughs> Do I, Speak. Judy, Speak. Judy, if you are in the room. She's calling me so I can. <laughs> she, she has permission to speak. Okay, let me, I'll, I have, hi, I, hi I Judy. I don't know what is happening. Time zooms in the blue room. I have a problem. Is it possible I ask my, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, if, so. Here it goes. It, it's not connecting to my microphone. I get Zoom everywhere. Yes, I, let me double check, but I think I can put you on speaker if everyone's okay with that. Yeah. All right, I'm going to put you on speaker in just a second. Okay, Judy? Thank you. No problem. All right, Judy, you are now on speakerphone. Okay, I have a question about an item that I saw on the budget that piqued my curiosity, 
and that is the water bill for the library coming in at $16,000. So I know you didn't buy new washing machines to wash all the books every week. And so I, I think that goes to the irrigation of the grounds at the library. And I'm wondering why we would have to spend so much money. You want to turn this on. All right, Judy, I think we could, oh. Yeah, yeah. she's going to take her mute off. Yeah. If... Okay, or, well, I think, oh, I... I can dance. Okay, yes, if you move away from the computer and then um, the question will be answered. So I'll I'll keep you on here if... Oh, no. Are you able to hear on the Zoom if I disconnect the call now that um, they've heard the question? Okay, I will... The line item for sixteen thousand dollars for um, water, and it, so that piqued my curiosity. And my thought was, it goes to the irrigation outside. And I'm wondering, do we really need to have the grass so green? <laughs> it seems like a, a lot of money to um, for aesthetics. Right. And Judy, I'll keep you on here to make sure you can hear a response. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. No problem. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, actually, the majority of that water bill just goes for the you know, maintenance of a building that's open nine to nine. It's open seven days a week. And we get um, several hundred thousand people through the door every year. So it is mostly uh, regular plumbing. Uh, that that is that water bill. Um, it is also irrigation or, or sprinklers as well. But you know, again, we worked with consolidated, and we started irrigation later and ended sooner. And we've kind of been creeping that number uh, pretty regularly. And within the last year, year and a half, uh, again, um, thanks to consolidated facilities. Um, the irrigation system also installed kind of a, a rain gauge so it knows not to go when it has rained. Uh, so we've done a lot of work on trying to uh, reduce the sprinkler cost, uh, but the increased use of the building, especially rebounding after uh, low use from COVID, it is, it's, mostly, it's mostly sinks and toilets. Thank you very much for answering that question. Sure. No. I appreciate it. It's a great question. Thank you. All right, Judy, yes, is it okay? I'm going to hang up, Emily. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you, Judy. Thank you for calling. Question about um, the additional funding um, side of uh, so between the Federal Library, the Milton Library Foundation, and the trustees. How, um, how consistent is the amount that you get from each of those groups? and? And have you seen, have there been years where it's been uh, issue? Sure. Um, so uh, the easiest answer is it's fairly consistent. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Friends run a, a very good membership program and they run a very good bookshop and they have been able to fund the programming at about that level um, for the past several years. Um, the foundation has also been able to fund at about that level. So the foundation money is often different in that we request it based on different services or new ideas that we're trying to pilot. So that number might fluctuate from year to year. Um, and with the trustees, again, that has, um, that, that has depended a lot on sort of, uh, building capitalish needs. Uh, uh, unfortunately, and this community knows better than anyone probably that, you know, f funding capital requests for the town is difficult. So if the trustees can use trust funds to help move along a capital need by, you know, 
splitting costs or something. That's something that we've looked at over the past. Uh, so the num those numbers are fairly good. I know that there's been, um, there have been years where numbers were down. Um, there were years when the fund, like when municipal funding of the library went down, donations to the library went down. Um, so, but we've been very fortunate the last several years. Thanks. I have just one question about the um, the numbers you had about programming because yes. I think you had that there are six hundred plus programs and then five hundred plus for children and teens. I was just curious: is it five hundred plus out of the six hundred plus yes, or separate categories? Five hundred out of the six hundred. Yeah. Okay, so great. the majority of the programs are are going to be children's programs. I don't know, Sarah, eighty percent. It's a lot uh, because they're able to run multiple story hours in the morning uh, and. Overall, children and family are more available to programs than adults who have to come to warrant committee meetings and other things at night. So, yes, yes, that, that is. Thank you. Yes. I was just curious about that breakdown. But the library is an excellent place to conduct those meetings. The library has some very nice facilities that are available to the public. That's right. We have multiple meeting rooms, um, and you know, we host. Uh, we host town committee meetings, but we also host Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, you name it, we're, we're open for business. Hi. Can you talk about the request to spend an additional 9,000 on books, and if we don't do it, we don't get 50,000? Yes. 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 Please, please talk about sure. that. So um, there is, there's a funding formula um, created by the Mass Board of Library Commissioners. Um, the library, um, based on population uh, and based on Milton's population, we need to spend 13% of our, at least 13% of our municipal appropriation on books and materials. So the number is a moving number. If the budget's less, that $9,000 will go down. If the budget's more, the $9,000 goes up. So it's, it's based on what the total um, appropriation is for the library. Oh, so you're saying if your needs based request is I want to hire another librarian and a half. Right. And if you approve those, you also need to give me $9,000 for books. That's correct. But if we don't hire the other librarian and a half, we don't need to give you the 9,000. That's correct. Thank you. I was confused. Yes. But I, I will say that that is the state minimum requirement. So you're just funding to the base level at that point. And one quick follow up on that. So that's to get that funding that you said from the state has increased significantly. Yes. That's okay. That's right. That's one piece of it. Uh, another part of it is called the municipal appropriation requirement. Um, I didn't talk about that tonight because uh, this budget, as well as the the level budget that uh, we submitted to the town, would both meet that requirement. That requirement is another formula where you take the average of your last three years of appropriations, multiply it by two or two and a half percent and add that to it. And then the library has to meet that threshold. But we've met that by in both scenarios. I could share that with people, but it's complicated. Can I also ask a follow up? You, you shared the information about like how much we spend per uh, circulation or whatever. I'm just asking, can you share those stats with us and more? Because yes. we've talked around this table about the statistic of the schools and how Milton, what Milton spends per pupil compared to our peer communities. Sure. And, uh, I, I saw them flash by on the screen. Yes. So, yeah, you. so I can share those. Those are collected by the Mass Board of Library Commissioners. The most recent data, I think, still is fiscal 21. That's fine with me. Okay. I have a question, and I don't know that it relates to funding per se, but um, in the Equity and Inclusion Subcommittee, does that um, subcommittee make recommendations on um, books? Like uh, that sort of, do, do they? In, um, space planning book like materials that you purchase electronic like all of that would that be 
or no? No, so that's a, that's <laughs> a good question. So, uh, so that's a, a, a subcommittee of the library trustees, and they they don't get down to the nitty gritty of, of book selection, which is done by the librarians. Um, last year, one of the focuses was on trying to do some more orientation and open house events to try to bring in um, new people to the library. Um, they have worked, again, with the Equity and Justice for All Committee um, when they were doing their report. Uh, they are, they work with the library staff as needed um, to be prepared for book challenges, um, which are happening more and more in Massachusetts. Um, and we had, uh, prior to the trustees committee, uh, the library itself had some ad hoc within the staff and, and it involved um, both library staff, trustees, and community members. Um, uh, DEI sort of groups where we're trying to make sure that the library is accessible, uh, that the library is meeting different age groups, uh, all different kinds of demographics as far as programming, uh, collections, and, and everything. So this is the trustees arm of that, this, making sure uh, that whatever initiatives the library has, um, they've been over, overseeing it at a, at a higher level. So sure. as far as staffing goes, so you, there's been no increase in staffing in? Oh, um, I, mean, I think five years, could be longer, I'd have, I'd have to double check. We had, uh, much like, like Chief Madden, the, the one and a half FTE were approved by the personnel board five plus years ago. Um, the last time that we increased staffing was uh, probably the last override, which I, I, I want to say was five or six years ago. Right? I just have one follow-up. Sure. You mentioned book challenges happening more in the state. So is that something you've had to deal with in the Milton Public Library? Uh, we, I did not sound what I could, but we have been fortunate. We have not had to deal with any book challenges here in Milton. Um, some of our neighboring communities have had to deal with them. What's a book challenge? Uh, somebody will come into the library and request that you no longer have that book in it. Okay. Um, and um, for um, a couple of years ago, it was mostly uh, race-based. Uh, over the past year or so, it's been uh, gender and sexual identity-based. So. I'm sorry. I'm like, I almost don't even want to go there, but I'm like that. Don't so us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's so it sounds like it's more involved than just because my inclination would be like, no, thank you. We're going to keep <laughs> doing what we're doing. Right, so it sounds right. like it's more involved so, than that. So the library has a policy. The trustees have approved a, a policy whereby a person could uh, ask for a book to be removed. Um, there's several steps in that challenge process. Um, I will say this um, you, just Broadly speaking, um, when books are challenged all over the country, um, more times than not, those books stay in the collection. Um, it's um, it, it's more rare that one is is removed. Uh, it's also more common for challenges to happen in li um, school libraries, um, in which case uh, books might be more often removed than a public library, but often they're just moved to different grade levels. Um, I'm not as, you know, I'm not um, as versed in, in the school libraries. Um, but yes, we have a several step process um, and, and the library trustees have been in, involved in, in that. Um, the Mass Library Association and ALA uh, are supportive of libraries um, when these things happen too. Thank you. Yes. I also hope I have not jinxed you. <laughs> Just uh, you never know. It's all right. Is there time for one quick note from the trustees? Absolutely, add, please. If you please. Um, as the elected officials uh, overseeing our director, we'd just like to add a, a note of urgency uh, and big picture, and that is the um, library's budget of one point eight million dollars. The ask of this year is less than two percent of the overall town budget. But as you've seen, our excellent director and our excellent staff uh, supply the town a significant amount of service, a significant amount of impact 
to all demographic groups that per dollar spent and also per hour uh, implemented is high. And that staff has been the same. And our, we have a, a director who's excellent, and he's also very modest. Uh, his request for additional staff has been pre-2018, which is when, when it was then approved by the HR committee uh, and has not been met. And so the staff uh, that are doing a fantastic job, and this is where an uh, element of concern or urgency comes from the trustees, is that high level of hours of implementation and the high quality of service of the stats that you're requesting to look at more closely, which are uncomparable, to, uh, are comparable to towns bigger than Milton. The amount of circulation that gets uh, addressed and the amount of programming that gets implemented in the space um, is, is um, the same rate as towns almost twice the size of Milton. The uh, trustees are concerned that that high level, uh, as of course the, the population of the town increases and the high level of quality uh, will be taxed and uh, can't be sustained necessarily. That's our concern. Um, and so we, are, uh, we ask that there's a, um, a strong level of uh, urgency also has looked at that number, that our director's request is less than 3% over his request last year. And uh, we, the, the trustees would like to uh, say that we're committed to trying to keep that request annually to be less than 3% as we, through the, the trustees uh, um, trust fund, the foundation and the friends will continue to support the director to um, pay for all the one-time capital costs, the small costs uh, that are one-time expenditures uh, to support the director uh, in the annual budget so that uh, the library can have the staff funded by the town to meet the needs uh, of the, uh, the citizens on a daily basis. Um, they do a fantastic job and um, they have been the same staff pre-COVID and the numbers during COVID and since COVID have every year, every month increased. Uh, and so um, given the small percentage of the overall budget, which uh, the, the two positions are $80,000, which is less than 0.007% of the overall budget, uh, the trustees would ask that that be looked at and considered because of the high impact of that very small percentage. Uh, as we know, we have one of the best libraries in the Commonwealth uh, and we'd love to sustain it that way and also sustain the people who are working so hard in that library uh, to keep it such. Uh, I think if you review those uh, stats that the director uh, offered you on how well uh, the library does compared to all other libraries uh, in terms of impact and in terms of hours, it's very impressive. We're very proud of our director and we stand strongly behind this budget and his ask. Thank you for that consideration. We know, we understand how tight those lines are. We would just uh, advocate for uh, the impact of that small percentage uh, that serves so many people in our community so, so often. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next on the agenda, we have Department of Public Works, Mr. Chase Berkeley. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. And welcome to the new members. Uh, so, if uh, Mr. Chair, if it makes sense, uh, I thought I'd follow the narrative I submitted so we can go in order with that because it kind of lays out uh, on how our department's set up. Uh, so, Chase Berkeley, again, uh, Director of Public Works uh, since 2017. So, um, <clears throat> the DPW comprises seven main budgets um, and is somewhat probably is unique to m most town departments where our personnel costs are spread by way of fixed percentage over those budgets so every employee is paid uh, percentage wise from seven different funding sources so when we talk about uh, personnel increases you have to consider the impact across the general fund budgets and then also the enterprise funds there are three enterprise funds that fall within the dpw water sewer stormwater so those are in the salary spreadsheet that was submitted to you and it shows you how those are broken down um, so dpw has three different collective bargaining units in it the clerical union the managers union and the mipa union which is the Milton public employees or the field crew all of those Collective bargaining agreements have expired as of June 30th and are in negotiations with no resolution as of yet. So the salary and wages that are submitted are um, 
at the FY23 levels, and there's a set-aside article that will cover that increase for FY24 that's separate from the figures we submitted. So hopefully we can get those contracts ratified somewhat soon and we know what that impact will be. Uh, as far as staffing, we have four vacancies in our field crew right now and one vacant civil engineer. So uh, we had, you know, similar to the conversation today, we had a difficult time filling empty positions. Um, for us, it's mostly uh, competition with the construction industry. So when we need to hire a truck driver with the CDL, we're competing against private industry, private construction, and uh, the wage scale just doesn't come even close to what the private sector pays. Uh, and, and also other utilities, you know, gas utilities, electric utilities, pay better than us usually. So uh, there's a lot of incentive for people to kind of jump ship. And I can tell you, you know, in my time in government, um, you know, used to have to be the mayor's nephew or someone to get one of these jobs. And that kind of mentality of, you know, locking in a long-term government job with a pension just doesn't seem to be enough of a draw to get the younger workforce uh, to go after these. So, um, you know, unfortunately, the best time to get uh, positions filled is in tough economic times in our situation. So we will need to wait most likely until construction slows down and the workforce um, is a little more plentiful to hopefully get some, some people in the door. So we're you know, primarily a service oriented department where if we have less people, we can do less things. You know, we obviously fall under uh, agencies like the EPA and the DEP, but um, a lot of what we do is service based. You know, we can maybe patch less potholes or empty less trash barrels, but um, we'll certainly get by. Um, four people is, is a lot, but it's not completely detrimental. So um, we'll stay positive and hope that we um, get back filled reasonably soon. And so um, the three uh, the three main budgets were all submitted with the guidelines we were given, which is basically level funded with contractual increases. So uh, that's the DPW general budget, um, our vehicle maintenance budget. So the department services all the vehicles for ourselves, the police, the fire. Um, we split some costs with the parks department, and the cemeteries do their own thing. And we don't. We don't fix the cemetery vehicles, so it's basically everything but cemeteries. Comes uh, on aging, you do. Comes under the vehicle maintenance. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And then snow and ice uh, historically has always been underfunded. Um, the Commonwealth allows you to push that deficit to the following year if you need to. It's the only budget you're allowed to really do that with. Um, so our typical average winter is five to six hundred thousand dollars. It's funded at one hundred and sixty. It has been for several years now. So. Um, we know going in, we're in a deficit right off the bat, you know, knock on wood, we've had a good winter so far, but we're definitely seeing inflationary costs, particularly salt and trucking. So, um, you know, a ton of salt cost about $45 a ton three years ago, it's $72 now. So, you know, that, that just, you know, affects the bottom line, obviously. So, um, we're dealing with all those, you know, rising supply chain and, and um, you know, raw material cost increases that you see, you know, widespread. Um, and then one of the, the biggest components of our budget, but it's actually mostly contractor work, is obviously that solid waste program. So um, <clears throat> about a year ago, we entered into a new five-year agreement with the current hauler, which is Boston Carding. The trucks still say Sunrise Scavenger, but they were bought out. Um, and so we're in year one of that, that, that extension for hauling. And that... Um, that is essentially like a broadcasted percentage increase. Uh, starts off at two and it goes up half a percent per year after that. So next year it'll be two and a half percent, the year after that it'll be three percent. Um, so that was actually a really good deal at the time. It was overall about a 13 percent increase over five years. So we were actually kind of lucky on timing that we were able to execute that last year. Because I think if we did it now, we, we would uh, not be in the same picture. So um, on the disposal side, the the costs of, of disposal have really gone through the roof in the industry. We don't have any control over that really. Regionally, there's not a lot of places to take trash and recycling without driving a lot of miles. So uh, our trash goes to Covanta and Braintree. Our uh, recycled material goes to Waste Management and Avon. And uh, we negotiate with them to get the best price possible. Uh, if you look at trucking anywhere else, it starts uh, affecting the hauler's pocket and he's you know entitled to um, additional compensation beyond a certain number of miles from the town that he may have to travel. So again, we're in a good place now. Those agreements are three years. Uh, this will be the first year. So 
Um, there are some increase though, I think if you look at uh, the solid waste budget, um, particularly on the, the refuse disposal, which is municipal solid waste or trash, um, our prices jumped when the last agreement expired. And then on top of that, we've definitely seen an increase in tonnage from COVID that still has not come back to historic levels. So um, certainly when we were isolated and, and you know everyone was working from home, the tonnage went way up because Milton is primarily a residential community. People weren't going to work, they were staying home. And so all that trash was being thrown away. Um, and you know, we actually sold a lot of water and sewer because of the same reason they were home all day instead of going to work. So, um, you know, we're still seeing those numbers higher than they were historically before COVID. So we factored that into the budget request. That's why it's it's a little higher. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, there's no, no doubt about it. There's still a lot of people that still work from home, um, even if it's only part time or a couple of days a week. We see that effect. Um, and um, the landfill closure, that's that's really just a a regulatory uh, monitoring requirement that doesn't the, the amount of that really didn't change, so that's level funded as well. Uh, we just required to take groundwater samples around the old landfill in the Milton side of the Quarry uh, Hills Golf Course uh, to meet compliance with that landfill closure. So um, on top of that, uh, I'll just touch on the three enterprise budgets. So again, the expenses were level funded. What happens in the enterprise funds uh, is a little bit of a different dynamic. So. Uh, water and sewer, we are MWA communities uh, on both ends. So our biggest operating costs are our payment or our assessment to the MWRA. So in the case of water, it's just over 50% of the budget. In sewer, it's about 75% of the budget. So essentially, whatever their assessment changes, our budget needs to mirror it to be able to face. So for, uh, for the upcoming year, our water assessment is going to go up 3.7%, 3 and our sewer is going to go up 4.65%. Luckily, um, we have some debt falling off the books, which is going to offset a little bit of that increase. So when we go to set the rates, those percentages will likely be less than that. Um, and the overall budget increase will likely be less than that. But um, it, it was just good timing with where the debt that, you know, from our bonding uh, starts to trail off and these increases hit. Um, there was an offset, which was, uh, was not always the case. And, and it's something we watch very carefully. So when we we plan our capital work, we forecast a cash flow and a bonding schedule. And we know that if we borrow money in a certain month, when that debt service payment will hit first and what fiscal year those rates will need to account for that. Uh, so we try very carefully to make sure we account for those bondings ahead of time so that we don't get a kind of like a cyclical high and low year and try to smooth that curve out to, to keep the rate increases as manageable as possible for the residents. Um, and then on stormwater, again, it's a level funded request for expenses, but because of some debt service and the, the bonding that just happened this past February, um, that budget's probably gonna need to go up about seven or 8% just to cover the, the new debt um, and um, make sure that we can pay that off. And then, um, so that's kind of high level of, of all of our main core functions. Um, there's a couple of things that sometimes get swallowed up by DPW that people just don't realize we do. So the CONCOM is a separate department, well, a separate board and, you know, they have volunteer board, but their secretary is also an employee of the DPW. So uh, her salary comes out of our budget, but they have their own separate budget that you'll see different from the DPW that they submit that on their own. It's very small uh, comparatively, and they have spending limits annually that they're allowed to, um, they're only allowed to spend so much money. but. There is a position that was authorized in the 2017 override called the conservation agent. It's a consultant that we use to cover that. And that um, money comes out of the DPW budget as well. So it's um, about $50,000 a year to have that CONCOM agent um, on retainer. Um, and I think I covered everything I wanted to highlight, but I'm very happy to go into any more detail and answer any questions you had. Um, and I brought with me all the detailed budgets. If you want to dig into any of the numbers, I'm happy to do that too. Hi. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Nope. Uh, can I ask about the water and sewer and stormwater assessments? So. 
certainly as a town meeting member when those would come up I would just vote yes what stupid question maybe I should ask Nick this when the water and sewer come before us and before town meeting what is it we're voting on for other budgets we're voting the town will give you this money for water and sewer we're voting that you'll collect this money from the ratepayers and what are we voting yeah on? so town meeting authorizes the appropriation for the enterprise fund and that is the dollar amount that the department and the town administrator determined is necessary to run that utility for the year uh, including the mwa payment and then all the operational costs and debt service and salary and wages those are the four kind of main buckets there so town meeting appropriates that budget once we get to the end of the fiscal year after town meeting we look at the consumption that actually occurred and how much revenue we took in and then we design the next year's water and sewer rates to break exactly even uh, and i have to give mr public credit he's been instrumentally helpful with the stormwater and particularly in uh, helping us design those rates in the past since he has um, a background in that but so so basically the rates are designed to break even looking at previous consumption uh, over a longer period of time so Milton um, is a heavy town when it comes to irrigation so if we have a dry year we sell a lot of water and we sell <laughs> a lot of water at a higher tier or higher rate block so as you buy water through your meter it gets more expensive per gallon so you you hit these these levels of water costs this much per gallon until you get to this amount and then it gets more expensive and then it gets more expensive and then it gets more expensive. So the biggest users pay more for their water than the small, you know, single family homes or, you know, uh, elderly that don't consume as much and it defers those costs to the large users or, you know, irrigation systems usually use a lot of water comparatively to a typical household, depending on the size of the property. So, so that is by design, I'm sorry, go ahead. That, that increased here. Yes. By usage yeah, that's something that the, uh, the board over the years has developed and on purpose made it um, an incline rate block so that it's more expensive at the higher consumption levels. Okay. Sorry, Jeff. So the number that we vote on, are we saying this is the maximum amount you will bill the rate payers in the year? So billing is based on actual consumption. So we bill True. With, okay. with Good the point. Actual, what we actually meet it. Okay, sorry. Um, the, the number that is presented to town meeting is the appropriation of what we believe the budget needs to be to run the utility for the year. Okay. But if we don't take in that enough money because we have a wet year and we don't sell enough water and sewer, um, that's when our reserve fund balance may need to pick up that shortfall because we might still need to spend the money to run the utility or pay the MWRA, but we didn't take in enough revenue to do that. So we have fund balances in each enterprise fund um, to help soften the blow if that does happen. Or in a good year, those funds go back into those reserves and build them up more. Great question, thank you for that. <laughs> Did you have a question? I don't have a question. Does anyone else have a question? I've got some more. Please. As you said, I've, I've worked on stormwater. I, what does the stormwater pay for? And I'm, I'm asking this because I struggle to understand it. And a lot of people in town look at their bills and stormwater bill and say, what is this? Yeah. And I don't know. What Just to another say. tax. <laughs> so it, it is an important distinction that it is a utility bill and tax exempt properties pay it too. So we bill every property in Milton, including ourselves, the town pays its own stormwater bills. Um, so under the stormwater enterprise funds, there's a component of salary and wages, but it's relatively small, 7% of salary and wages for the DPW. Uh, it pays for all of the operational costs to maintain about 100 miles of stormwater collection. So all the catch basins that are on the side of the roads and all the pipes that connect those and then bring that water to the, the waterways. So there's an operational cost to keep that up, up to date, replace it, and to repair it when it breaks and to keep it clean. Uh, on top of that, it also pays for all the street sweeping. So any, all the street sweeping we do is charged to the Stormwater Enterprise Fund because that's a direct pollutant that gets into our waterways. Um, and in addition to that, the yard waste collection and disposal is charged to the stormwater enterprise fund because leads are the number one clogger of, of drains. Um, and so that's a justified cost against that. So um, on top of that, the town has a permit with the EPA and DEP that we have to meet certain permit requirements uh, to promote water quality and to make sure that um, development doesn't have adverse effects on the existing waterways. So 
um, that permit requirements are all built into that stormwater enterprise fund. So we need to go out and find pollutants actively and eliminate them. We need to uh, watch development and make sure that they don't, um, you know, typically when uh, a property is being developed, the most vulnerable time was when they demolished the building and kind of scraped the land free and you get a big rainstorm and all that silt and mud gets washed into the system, clogs it up or, you know, has an adverse effect on the Ponza River or the Pine Tree Brook or, you know, whatever water body is close by. So uh, there's a lot of strict permit requirements on development that we're required to implement and keep an eye on, on development and, and construction activity. And then it just, like simple things like it pays for the fuel that, for the vehicles that are dedicated to stormwater. So the street sweeper and the catch basin cleaning machine, their fuel bill comes out of it. So anything basically that can be clearly identified or even partially related to that, that activity uh, gets put there. Can we ask about your needs based requests? Well, happy to answer any questions, sir. So um, do you have the list of what was submitted or? No, okay, so, so um, and Mr. Geister would be happy to uh, confirm with me on this. We're hearing loud and clear from the residents of Milton that they want more traffic calming. Um, so uh, if you remember a couple of years back, there was a committee formed called the Traffic Mitigation Committee, which was a separate, uh, like one-time effort from the tra Traffic Commission that's uh, perpetual, uh, recommended that a series of improvements be made across the town and also that the town hire a dedicated traffic engineer, either by full-time employer or consultant. So uh, we included that in there, as well as um, a few years ago, the planning department oversaw a project to build a traffic computerized traffic model for the town so that we have the ability to analyze impacts of development or uh, road closures or traffic pattern changes. So we put some um, money requested there to be able to uh, run scenarios in that model. Basically, you have to pay a consultant to input uh, what you'd like to see results for. Um, the other thing we put in, so we've been very fortunate um, in, in the world of grants. Uh, so the DPW engineering department has been receiving several grants and we also receive a lot of ARPA money uh, for water sewer projects. Um, but most of the time the grants we apply for require some sort of town match. A lot of them can be in-kind services where we can uh, put a dollar figure on the time spent by the town engineer or civil engineer, myself, or whoever works on the effort. But uh, particularly the MassDOT grants under the Complete Streets program. So uh, for an example, the Pierce Middle School five-way intersection, we've gotten two grants for that. And uh, they pay for about 75% of the construction, but the town has to come up with that other piece. And that's not always budgeted or appropriated. So uh, we put in some money in anticipation of that, you know, hopefully continuing to receive grant funding uh, to cover the town's end of it and not have to absorb it and kind of give up something else in exchange. Um, and then uh, we requested a, an increase for the snow removal budget to try to get it a little closer to reality, um, to move that up to about 250,000. Um, there is a kind of a tipping point. You don't want to set it too close to actuals because if you have um, a good year and you don't spend a lot of money, you can't reverse it. You're not allowed to do that. So. Um, you know, it, it does make sense to short fund it, but if we get it a little closer to reality, um, what typically happens in a year, uh, at the end of the year is um, the town accountant, the town administrator will kind of look to where there's surplus money in other departments and try to cover any shortfalls um, with those surpluses and not defer to the next year unless it's you know really needed. So by doing that, by having more money in the budget, it relies less on unanticipated surplus in other places. So I don't know if you would know this on, offhand, but so we've had like no snow this year. So how would, but I'm sure it still costs for whatever we've had. So what would a year like this year budget wise be? Do you? Yeah, so we're not there yet, obviously, but you know, we're, we're definitely under, so the cost of um, snow and ice removal goes up exponentially when we have to plow. So we have to bring in contractors to cover all the roads that you know, will change a storm that costs 30 or $40,000 to maybe 150, 160 for one storm. So we haven't had to do that full scale yet this year. Um, and I won't say anything because we've had blizzards in, in late March, but um, you know, we're, we're trending to be okay in, in, on the other side of our, our average uh, right now. Let's, let's hope it stays that way. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Brian. Let's take that.
We talked about the roads, the paving, capital. What is, and you, I think you had said 20 million was to pave all the roads. Oh yeah, so like- If the, you, yeah. uh, there's a list, I think, I don't know if it's on the website, I saw a list, mm -hmm. you sent it out, that it's to pave all the roads, 20 million? 20 yeah, million. so the town did a pavement um, inventory, basically ranked every, every road in town, get, gives it a numerical score on its condition. And then um, through that process, we come up with an estimate of what would it cost the town to bring every road to a satisfactory condition. That number is about $20 million. However, that doesn't include the peripheral work of you need to bring sidewalks into ADA compliance. Most cases, we have to rebuild a lot of the sidewalks because they're just as old as the roads. Um, so that, that's just talking about pavement. Um, our paving, we've been very fortunate that the Capital Committee has been able to supplement our Chapter 90 funds from the, the town, uh, from the state. So uh, on a typical year, we get $630,000 from the state. Uh, the Capital Committee has been able to fund an additional million 800,000 to a million over the last five or six years towards that. So uh, that's really helping catch up. Uh, you know, Aqua was great at the beginning because it, it, it flushed cash into the market, but it has you know, had the effect that, you know, inflation has swelled those paving costs. We don't, um, not able to pave as, as much as we used to for the same dollar, but um, there's a little bit more of the money going around at the same time. <laughs> Just noticed Judy has a hand. Judy, <laughs> you have your hand up? Yeah, I think Zoom might be working now. Yes. Uh, oh, yes. Emily, thank you. Thank you, Karen. And sorry to all the members for whatever's going on with this Zoom. Um, to go back to Jay's um, questions on stormwater, if I understood your answer correctly, Chase, is it that when we put out yard waste, <clears throat> that pickup now is being charged to the stormwater enterprise fund? Yes, that's correct. And that's been the case um, since the enterprise fund was created. Before we had that, um, I know I've always put out yard waste here in town. How was that funded before? It was in the solid waste budget with trash and recycling, which is in the general fund funded by the tax levy. Okay. Oh, thank you. Back to my $20 million question. So what would you need, what do you think it would cost if you had everything, if you were able to do all the roads, all the periphery to get oh, where- Oh, overall, I mean, obviously it's more than 20 million. I don't have an exact figure yet. Um, you know, we could try to make some estimates. Uh, contractor curious. availability is an issue. It's hard to pin down contractors um, and get them to come into town. So we participate in a group called the Southeast Regional Services Group. So it's about 11 or 12 towns. We aggregate all of our construction work together to get better unit prices, but we give up a little bit on control of schedule. So um, we're able to add our quantities in with, you know, most of the towns from Milton South to about South Attleboro. Um, it saves us, you know, considerable amount, but um, it's, it can be very hard to sometimes get get the contractors in when you want them. Um, everybody likes to pave right before school starts, and it's the same ask from you know twelve towns at the same time, and they can always look themselves so many ways. So, um, you know, that's just a kind of a constant battle that we go through. There's a lot of logistics and setting up. When do we do the sidewalks? When do we pave the street? Right. You know, we work a lot with gas and electric to get their utilities upgraded before. So. Um, we, we don't want to go back to the street after we pave it and have to touch it for a long time. Right. Okay. And nobody loves paving streets more than us because it makes our life a lot easier. So oh. we're, all, we're all for that. Absolutely. <laughs> Although that's a good traffic calming measure. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> Not paving. And, and, and back to the traffic calming and the, the needs based and maybe hiring a traffic engineer. I mean, People love to talk about traffic in this town, and people would love to see traffic improved in this town. Sell me on this. What is a traffic engineer? What do they do? How is a traffic engineer going to make my life better? So if you look at the traffic mitigation report, it, it, it was a phenomenal report. Jeff Mullen led the crew, who was the you know, state administrator uh, for the governor a number of years ago. Um, 
it talks a, a lot about a lot of small victories. There's no one fix to fix the, the, the issue here. I mean, you just look at a regional map and draw a line from Boston to anywhere south and Milton is in the way. <laughs> People know that. And they use, use our roads to get to and from the city every day. And there's roads that you can't get down from you know seven to nine in the morning and then you can lay across them in the middle of the day. Uh, it's a very <laughs> unique dynamic where you have that influx in and out. Right. So, so the difficult part is you need to be able to handle capacity, but also you want to slow people down in between. Um, so, you know, the idea of shrinking uh, lanes and, and, you know, choking things works to a degree, but um, it's not going to solve the problem. It's going to, you know, especially with modern GPS technology, it's going to divert it and, and you're going to find ways around any type of one fix. So we need to take a wholesale look at not just Milton, but also our regional partners and, and go after the small victories, things like Brook Road, where we we're able to implement a road diet beside Kelly Field and go from four lanes to two, but still accommodate the volume. But now you have a lot more, um, you know, passive space on the sides. It makes people feel a lot more comfortable uh, walking down the sidewalk or riding a bike. Um, and, you know, if you can do that kind of wholesale across the town, um, that that's a big victory. Traditionally, the DPW has really only been able to implement traffic calming on roads that were already paving because there's just been no separate budget. There's been no separate mechanism to kind of work on things outside. Uh, over the past few years, we've been receiving money from rideshare, Uber, Lyft, and those things. We get funds from that, and we've been able to buy uh, all those radar signs. You see the flash of speed and the flashing stop signs and the flashing warning signs and um, all those kind of like little things that, that all add up in an aggregate to help. And the blinky lights around a stop sign help calm traffic? Okay, so that's a visibility thing. It, it helps with compliance of the stop sign which people... Does that really help? Yeah, yeah, especially so one of the recommendations in the, you know, the manual traffic control devices is that you put those in places where um, you want to either grab someone's eye or maybe there's a short visibility because there's a curve in the road or there's some obstruction. Um, and particularly at night when it's harder to see pedestrians, you know, if you look at the fatality rates of pedestrians, they usually happen at twilight because uh, it can just be harder to see them. So anything you can do to make people drive more compliant and, and make those make it feel more painful to violate a traffic control device um, is a help. It's not a fix. I agree. You know, I, I wish. It, it, <laughs> so the bottom line with traffic is, is 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 the biggest component of it is the hardest thing to control, which is human behavior. So mm -hmm. it's the individual behind the wheel and whether or not they're willing to respect the rules of the road. And it, it's very hard to, you know, design for someone who, who blows to a stop sign. So. Um, kind of a constant battle in that world. And we have a number of roads though too that are state controlled. We do, yeah. So those are, we couldn't do anything about that. So we do it through adv advocacy and through partnership with MassDOT mm -hmm. and DCR. So um, exactly. we don't only control the roads, we don't do the construction work, but uh, we help prioritize, we help you know make, make them aware of where we're hearing from our residents because all of those roads in town have homes on them. You know, the Milton residents that live on them, it's just the town doesn't have the control of the road. Is there anything in here for, and I, I didn't see it, and I know people have talked in the past, around um, um, where would things run, like vehicle maintenance, like the maintenance and upkeep of all the town's vehicles? Use would that be is this in this? So that's in the vehicle maintenance budget. Okay. Yep. So they have a standalone budget, okay. but it just includes police, fire, DPW, okay. and some of the parks and consolidated facilities. And that's a place where you know we're seeing the cost of repair parts swell. Mm -hmm. and all the I'm sure if we went into executive session, we could come up with some ways to make it more painful for people to violate the rules of the road. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Burley, thank you for your presentation thank you. tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, I think we have one more. I think we have Mr. Ritchie is going to join us by way of Zoom. He is here. He just needs to unmute. Good evening, everyone. 
Good evening. Thank you for hanging in there with us, Mr. Ritchie. Yeah, I guess, yeah, um, yes, well, I said it's good. I actually popped two things in my head. I was at a building committee meeting, Zoom, and now uh, listen, listen to all those fine, fine presentations ahead of me. So, <laughs> so, uh, so basically, you know, you, you, I hope you have my budget. Uh, I think my budget is pretty clear and simple. Uh, I'm asking for this year, and you can ask a lot of questions because I know some people think it's all good. Facilities that they don't know a lot about, but you can ask those questions then afterwards. And this one went to my book budget. Basically, I'm asking for $1,242,000. Uh, I'm only up a little bit from last year, pretty much level funded. The big part of my budget, you know, uh, almost 900000 in salaries. Uh, and I'm not asking for any uh, additional staff because I think there's other ways to achieve that. And um, $175,000 is put in for building improvements, $65,000 for custodial, and then all the rest is miscellaneous expenses, you know, uh, you know, basic contractor services, uh, buying wax, uh, supplies, our school do maintenance. That pretty much it. I don't think my budget is that complicated. It's really simple. I could use another million dollars to do the job I really needed to do. So that's pretty much all I have. I mean, I would really prefer it. People ask questions because I don't want to go through a little line item when only six, seven thousand little line items. I just don't think that's a waste of uh, good productive time. But if you have any questions, I gladly uh, entertain them at this point. If you read the budget and you know what I'm asking for. In light of that, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> I think uh, it's, go ahead, yeah. Jay. Hello, Mr. Ritchie, I'm Jay Fundling. We've been emailing back and forth a bit about Hi. the electric bills especially. And I'm looking at your consolidated facilities narrative and it says you're, you have 15 areas of responsibilities and one of those 15 is utility consumption. So do I understand correctly that your department is responsible for making sure we're not wasting electricity, for example? Um, there are many things that I do uh, as we are consolidated. Uh, what that really means is that when we're doing, uh, we have a green community, so that's why I put a lot of my time and effort. Since I've been here since 2006, I've brought in about $2.2 million in green community money funding. Uh, the town pretty much paid for my salary for the last 23 years. Uh, that's why I spent a lot of my time. All the utility, I work with the towns, I work with Chase Berkeley, the library. I'm not directly overseeing them. I work with them. If there's errors, uh, like, like, like questions like you would, you would ask, I try to get the, uh, the information, but I don't oversee everyone's utility budget. I work with them to make sure that they're being charged the proper money, and if there's, if there's error or omission, then my job is to kind of work with those departments. Okay, so it's the individual department's responsibility to run it efficiently, for example. Well, yeah, with that, it, it, well, it, it, you know, like the school department pays their own utility budget. I work with Glenn Power Check in the school department and, you know, make sure that, you know, if there's cost efficient ways, you know, if, it, if a bill came in, you know, really high, some of the bills that you've seen, $23,000, so we want to make sure that we're getting, you know, we're not being overcharged or, it was a, a long um, calibration. Then with the library, the COA, I don't have I, I don't have direct oversight of any of the budgets, uh, utility budgets. We're working very closely with uh, the town administrator right now on going up the, uh, the contract for a certain portion of the utilities, but I don't oversee the budget directly. Okay, okay. So that's the use um, and the very similar issue, but changing from use to like dollars, are you the one who provides to all, like if the library is setting their budget and the library is saying, oh, we think our electric bills are going up 15% next year. Are you the one who gives them that dollar amount? So all the budgets we're seeing right now, their utility uses, are they coming from you? I think it's a joint effort. I think it's the town administrator, the school is uh, uh, going to power check we year. You know, so we used to be a member of power, power offense. Right now, we're going up to the market with a different company to see if we can get a better deal. Um, obviously, everyone. I mean, you know, it's you know, I don't think it's uh, 
digital digital farm that everyone knows the, the budget uh, utilities in the last year, year was this was skyrocket natural gas oil gasoline so I think it was no surprise but you know we we do let all the farmers know that utilities have gone skyrocket and then we try to use a lot of behavioral science so that we don't keep the lights on all night we make sure we kind of rent down the boilers at night time and weekend so uh that's how we kind of achieve or where we should be and when the department tackle those questions like like work tonight i've been working with them we've been looking at maybe some solar power on top of the, on the rooftop different ways to kind of contribute to some of those prices so that's how we do it okay thanks a lot Anybody else? Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. It's true. It's very straightforward. Yeah. It's very straightforward. Thank you yeah. for that. Yeah. 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 So, you know, so I, I honestly, some of you know, I, I am retiring after 22 years and, and seven weeks, not the county, but uh, <laughs> it's been, you know, it's been a unique job. And obviously, you know, trying to work for, I'm the only department in town that has consolidated. Um, you know, work, you know, I answered the town administrator and the uh, superintendent school, so very unique. Uh, you know, I did my best, I put my heart and soul into the position, and I don't want to ask some more staff. I think there's other ways that work very, very good with the DPW department uh, in, in, uh, in project uh, planning and collaboration. I think there's other ways that the park department could be involved, that we all can work as a big, giant team and try to achieve that. I don't think so. And, I mean, as many people I'd like to have on the job more, but I think there's other ways to do that and not to burden the taxpayer with more dollars and more salaries and more health insurance. So that's, that's, that's my spell. It's refreshing. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your service to the town. And good uh, evening. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So that's, uh, we're through the agenda for tonight. Okay. Um, we're back on again on Wednesday for the main event. <laughs> Council on Aging. <laughs> it's going to be like the equivalent of Madison Square Garden. Oh, we're at the Council on Aging? I'm sorry. We are at the Council on Aging. Okay. I don't have my notes with me. I can get that to you. I have that, yes. I have that, yes. Um, and then, <clears throat> so it shall come to pass that we will have this meeting on Wednesday with regards to the uh, Giles Road, okay? It's, it's on the agenda for discussion and a vote. So we need to be prepared for a vote if we feel that it's, we're ready. It, of note is that the Conservation Commission hasn't actually had a formal vote yet with regards to their recommendation. I think that that's supposed to happen next week, next like Tuesday, I think. So something for us to consider. Just bringing that up now, is we're going to have some conversation from you know with regards to that. Um, and then I also th think that we're going to kind of be be getting the actual real budget recommendation on probably like monday or tuesday with regards to what the select boards take on the town manager's budget would be which would be the, a recommendation coming to us which is important to our deliberations to have to hear from town manager what's the town manager looking at to hear from select board, so with their with their budget committee, see what they're looking at. And then ultimately, it all comes back to us. So we have meetings that we were planning on having tonight, Wednesday, and then we'd kind of said Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday next week. I think we need to keep those open, but it might be. 
hard to make real actual decisions though, votes on budget if we haven't sort of seen them yet. <laughs> so we're starting to move into the next week as well. Okay, so I know that we had kind of put the following Monday um, on the calendar because originally, like, our date for this warrant to go to the printer is the 21st. Wow. They have articles to <laughs> go to the printer. You know, this is looking to be like one of those old, like, you know, those, I'm thinking of the, those early um, silent films where the train was going and the car goes right in front of the train before the train hits the car. That's going to be kind of like us and our budget. Is we're just going to end up squeezing right in front of that train. Right? So I'm just bringing these, this up now. Um, that we're going to you know, may, you know, maybe we might not need to do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday next week if we don't actually have anything in front of us. That might get kicked into the next week. And then the Warren Committee hasn't had a um, all-nighter. Saturday. What? I said all-nighter. We haven't had an all-nighter. We haven't had a Saturday in a while. Um. I learned my lesson. We'll never have a Friday meeting again. Oh, my goodness gracious. Wow. What was that? <laughs> we have the only one. Yeah, it was repeatedly pointed out to me. Oh, was that a problem? <laughs> so apparently the work Committee has a long history of Saturdays. So I'm just bringing up Saturday. Okay, this, it's all on the table. It's all on the table. I just keep picturing you, like, with all the budgets. In the red magic That's marker. We're getting, we're getting there. Yeah. <laughs> right? I, right? Yeah. We might, some might prefer a spreadsheet with red. You know, I'm a paper with the blue, what is that, blue painting tape? Uh, yep. Yep. Because it makes it easy to move things around. So if we have to put the budget up on the table and whatever. Whatever gets it done. Okay, so I'm just kind of bringing up those issues for scheduling. And, it, you know, and it'll be fun. So Wednesdays at the Council on Aging because we're expecting a crowd? Yeah. <laughs> Do we know who will be speaking? So we have, we reached, uh, so we reached out to, uh, so first is the, the, the school building committee. So this is going to be Kevin O'Rourke. Uh, we've asked for um, Sean O'Rourke. That's right, Sean Slate. Thank you for that, Sean O'Rourke. Uh, we'd asked for Conservation Commission to be there. Nick's going to be there. Uh, we'd ask for Town Council or someone who can explain to us what a taking is. There is. It looks to me. Like the recommendation is to go with eminent domain for reasons. So we would ask for an explanation as to why, right? Why? I don't know. There's a reason. Like to hear what that reason is. But you know, at the at the same time, it looks to me like the big issue is the land swap. That's the big issue. How the, the the mechanism by which, you know, follows. If it's a by all means necessary, it's by all means necessary. I mean, right? So it looks to me like the issue starts with. So the issue is not in the article, are we building a school? The issue is, Steve. So we had multiple debates last year on this, this subject, and a number of lawyers came forward and said it was not legal for what they were trying to do, and that just got covered up. They, they said, okay, we're going to pull it back, and I haven't heard a word about that since then. 
So I think is somebody going to explain that to us? Yes, sir. I think that that was the ask. You know, as we had said, you know, you know, I don't want to be, play like the unfrozen caveman attorney, you know, but like I. What's eminent domain? These words you use, these legal words, you use them, taking eminent domain. What, that means something. You know, tell us what it is. Why are we going to do it this way, by that way? What does this mean? I was just going to raise that it's not on our agenda tonight, so we probably should defer oh. discussion until when. Very well. Fair enough. So it's common. So that's Wednesday. So those are the speakers you think we'll have? Those are the speakers I think we'll have. And then it, the Conservation Commission, who will be talking to us, it's, I don't think they've done a formal vote on that yet. That was pointed out to me today. So maybe we're ready to make a vote. Maybe we're not ready to make a vote on the agenda in order to give us flexibility. I put down discuss and vote in light of our timeline. What? Judy, you have your hand up. I do, and my question only goes to the people that will be speaking. Um, we received letters from um, people that are somehow involved in this um, matter that's going to be for us on Wednesday. Um, would they be invited as well? Speaking to someone that filed um, an OML issue with the state, would they be available to ask questions of as well? Yeah, I, I think we could potentially. I haven't, nobody's, with regards to that, no. Nobody's approached and asked to talk to the warrant committee. I had been, re I forwarded to everyone what I received. Okay, that, which is my general policy, is that if someone sends it to me as the chair, I interpret that as to the committee. So my general policy is to share everything, uh, um, unless it's clear that the communication is between myself and the citizen. Um, but, and then like, as is our policy, I prefer to do all that through my town email. So that there's a record of that, right? But, so if there had been requests for me to share, I've, I've shared. Um, you know, we can, we can invite anyone we want at the at this point you know it's been it's we we had set it up as the presentation you know and but it's like what steve had said and i and i want to be careful and we're not going to go down the road and discuss this it's not an agenda item we we've had these conversations for a while um you know if there were people at you know we don't do you know public speak at the meeting but I could open the floor to, you know, it's a public meeting. If it would be helpful, if it's helpful to our deliberations, we would want to hear from people who could help us deliberate. So it would be better if people um, you know, asked ahead of time. So I don't want to go too far down, but I guess my only, my, I don't know, my question on that is like if it's a presentation of information for us to consider, I don't know how to consider it if I don't know the role of it. Do you know, like I said, if somebody's coming from the Conservation Committee, I know what their role is. Right, so sure. I I, that just, um, that's a little confusing. Sure. And we're being presented information from the people who are tasked with providing information, and that informs our decision, and that's been vetted as opposed to. 
but opinion, per se. Sure. That's, I, that's where I just have a hard time because of that. Okay. I just, I just would have a, a difficult time with that. That's just, that's just. Right. Because it, there's, um, you know, some positions are clearly advocacy. We'll survive. All right, anything else that we need to uh, address tonight? Is there a motion, Tom? A motion to adjourn. Seconded. Second. Is anyone opposed? No. It carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you.